Skinwalker Ranch, an innocent-seeming 512-acre parcel of land about 150 miles southeast of Salt Lake City, Utah. Innocent-seeming if you don't know anything about the decades of strange UFO sightings and cryptid encounters that have been reported to happen on or around the ranch. In the words of George Knapp, longtime investigative journalist and regular co-host of the famed UFOs and More radio show, Coast to Coast, it's been the site of simply an unbelievable amount of paranormal activity. UFOs, Sasquatch, cattle mutilations, psychic manifestations, you name it, residents here have seen it. People have even seen butterized dogs at Skinwalker Ranch. And if you don't know what butterized means, you will by the end of this suck. This is a strange story, Meat Sacks. From the early Navajo legends of the Skinwalker to ghost dinosaurs to Bigfoots and portals opening up in the sky, there's very little Skinwalker Ranch hasn't seen in terms of the paranormal and the extraterrestrial. Numerous reports of UFOs from all around the area date back to at least the 1930s. This isn't a tale of one isolated encounter. It's a tale of multiple up-close sightings witnessed by one group of people after another. Allegedly. There have been so many reported extraterrestrial sightings over the years that the U.S. Department of Defense even dedicated millions of dollars to investigate UFOs partly motivated by Skinwalker Ranch activity. A lot of people, people that list billionaires, government investigators, military leaders, even a senator, senator or two among them at one point or another have been very interested in the numerous alleged paranormal events that have happened around Skinwalker Ranch. Today's story is anything but simple or straightforward. Is it all just an elaborate hoax? Something to keep people interested in a large piece of desert in the middle of nowhere? Stories told to sell books and TV shows? Or is that exactly what the Illuminati want you to think? Wake up, sheeple! Excited to dig into today's cryptid-filled, paranormal investigating, extraterrestrial, there sure is a lot of weird shit going on down in one remote place edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Welcome to, or welcome back. To the cult of the curious. Hail Nimrod and Lucifina. Praise Bojangles and glory be to Triple M. I'm Dan Cummins, the suck master, mustachioed musketeer, thorn and undead Roy Disney's side, skinwalker walker, and you are listening to Time Suck. A recording here in the Suck Dungeon and CDA, the script keeper, the Reverend Doctor, the Art Warlock, and the Bad Magic Baroness, uh, all in the studio at different points today. The Queen of Bad Magic down in Riggins, Idaho, uh, with the kids, my fam, joining them soon for Pop Awards birthday bash, 88 years young. 88 years strong. Still making the devil wait before he moves on to the next plane and kicks that boogeyman right in the dick. Still getting up every day and getting shit done. Hail Pop Award. Uh, Got two new tees in the store at badmagicmerch.com and Logan Keith, resident art warlock, did not design them. Uh, They're fan art tees and they look amazing. Max Lazaro, uh, Will XX, you guys killed it. Thanks for more fantastic art, Max. Hope all is well with you in Belarus. Uh, At Max Lazaro uh, underscore art on IG. That's M-A-X-L-A-Z-A-R-A-U underscore art. And Will cannot wait to get back uh, uh, into your studio and get some more ink once all this craziness is over. Uh, If you're still in Salt Lake City or if if you've made it onwards by then, wherever wherever you're at, uh, at Will underscore XX on Instagram. Also, thanks for scooping up the VIP virtual gathering tickets. uh, I almost said space lizards, some space lizards, some ETEX. Uh, For 2020 sucks giving, you guys are the best. We're going to make that super fun on November 21st. Looking forward to a a Thanksgiving suck, uh, a drinking game, and a lot of laughs. Thank God for technology. How much more would 2020 suck if we didn't have the internet or video conferencing? So Zoom going to make that possible. Uh, general admission tickets to the event remain on sale through the end of the month. You still get the gift box and the show slash drinking game with those tickets. It's, uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun day. Uh, before we head into the show, uh, I just want to say, if you're wondering how today's info compares to the new History Channel show, The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch, I have no idea. Uh, while I am a history lover, not a lover of most of the History Channel's programming. Vikings, that shows a home run to me. But that's not supposed to be totally historically accurate. It's a, you know, it's a scripted show. It's a scripted drama. If the secret of Skinwalker Ranch is anything like, say, the Curse of Oak Island, eh, then it's not worth a shit, in my opinion. And, and I'm not going to waste my time on it. Once the History Channel went full ancient aliens, uh, they lost all factual credibility with me. Entertaining, yes. Credible, no. Okay, I just felt compelled to give that preface. Now let's get weird. Today we are sucking, of course, uh, Skinwalker Ranch, a Space Lizard chosen topic. Thank you, Space Lizards. This is, uh, I think this is going to be a fun one. 
it's been it's been fun to go over. A uh, massive property sprawls over 480 480 acres of northern Utah in a region known as the Uintah Basin. Skinwalker Ranch is also known as the Gorman Ranch, the Sherman Ranch, the uh, Adamantium Skinwalker Ranch, and it's sometimes referred to as one of Satan's nine gates to hell. Uh, why are there nine gates? Uh, maybe because Dante once wrote about nine circles. I'm not sure. I'll have to ask the devil directly. So grab a Ouija board and best of luck. Uh, Skinwalker Ranch first came to national attention in the mid-90s, 1990s, when the Sherman family, who had purchased the ranch in 1994, shared some stories with the media that some found credible and many others found, get the fuck out of here, come on. Uh, if you just don't believe in the possibility of the paranormal, a good chunk of today's suck. Most of it is going to elicit the, oh, come on, reaction. But I think it's still going to be very entertaining. If you do believe in the paranormal, today's suck still might garner that reaction in, in several moments. Uh, probably will. Even for UFO and cryptid believers, some of the accounts I'm going to share with you guys are uh, pretty hard to accept. And, and I'm glad. If nothing else, these stories are entertaining as hell. And if just some of them are real, if just one of them is real, holy shit, there is so much more about the universe we still don't know about. Uh, so, so much going on here on Earth we still don't know about, you know, as far as what's proven. As crazy as the Sherman's claims are, some scientists or at least some people with science-ish backgrounds working for a science sounding organization do believe them. Uh, most of our suck story today will be told through the timeline. I'll be honest, a lot of our information comes from some pretty fringy sources. Much of this suck is based on accounts found in four books. The Skinwalker Ranch by Conrad Bauer, The Hunt for the Skinwalker by Colm El uh, Kelleher and George Knapp, Lost on Skinwalker Ranch by Eric Retz, and No Trespassing by Ryan Skinner and D.L. Wallace. We did use a lot of other sources, sources you can find in the episode script on the Time Suck website and app, just not as many as normal. It's just not that kind of subject. Uh, before we jump into the timeline, let me tell you a little bit about the area where Skinwalker Skin Ranch sits. Uh, the ranch is located on approximately 512 acres, 10-mile drive southeast of Ballard City, Utah, only about five miles as the crow flies, and just over 150 miles southeast of Salt Lake City. About 1,000 people live in Ballard, and maybe if I went there, I'd feel differently, but seems like it might kind of be a shithole. I've, I've never been there. I've never been there, but the photos online, I got to say, don't exactly inspire me to want to head on over there. Doesn't seem to be a lot going on in Ballard. There's a Top Stop convenience store, and uh, that's, that's about it. It's more of a small suburb to the larger town of Roosevelt, home to around 7,000 people. Roosevelt gives me a real uh, lot of dually trucks and cowboy hats kind of vibe. Place probably heavy on cattle ranch talk, low on museum and theater talk. A lot of, lot of F-350s and Dodge Rams. A lot of diesel. A lot of diesel in Roosevelt. Not a lot of Teslas. I get it. I grew up in a place very similar. Uh, Roosevelt is um, maybe also not where I'd want to live, but they do have a little Caesar's pizza, okay? And a cool looking burger spot called the Round Robin Inn. Uh, and Marion's Variety, a place where you can get a solid barbecue burger, french fries, uh, cream soda, some chachis. And listen, there's not a lot going on in Roosevelt or Ballard or Fort Duchesne, another little 700 person dusty town and headquarters of the Ute Indian tribe less than 10 miles away. Not a lot happening outside of strange sightings in this area. The whole area around the Skinwalker Ranch, pretty rural, remote, and quiet. And that's part of the spookiness to me of today's story. The rural setting makes it more mysterious. All these little towns lie not off of the interstate, but off of a lonely little U.S. highway, Highway 191. The entire area also rests inside the vast Uintah and Ure American Indian Reservation, homeland of the Ute tribe, uh, almost 6,800 square uh, sparsely populated miles. Also, before I move on, Skinwalker Ranch is 512 acres. The Disneyland Resort we talked about last week, 510 acres. Huh. Almost the exact same size. Coincidence? Or does the possibly reanimated corpse of none other than Roy Matricide Disney have something to do with today's mysterious shenanigans? Makes one wonder. Uh, the rain around the, uh, the region, excuse me, around the ranch is nestled in the Uintah Basin, bordered, bordered by the Uintah Mountains, the Uintah Mountains, 150 miles long, sub-range of the Rockies that are the highest mountain range in the lower 48 states. They extend from Heber Valley on the west to Cross Mountain in Colorado to the east. The Uintahs contain some of the highest mountain peaks in the state, with King's Peak being the top pile of old rocks, shooting up to uh, 13,520 feet above sea level. During the Pleistocene era, the Uintahs were covered by glaciers. When the glaciers melted, they created lakes, so many lakes. Some of the larger northeastern Utah lakes serve as important reservoirs for the Wasatch Front, metropolitan region in the north-central part of Utah. 
The Wasatch Front uh, consists of a chain of cities and towns that stretch from Nephi in the south to Brigham City in the north. Roughly 80% of Utah's population resides in this region. It contains the major cities of Salt Lake City, Provo, and Ogden. The Uintah Basin, the place where Skinwalker Ranch sits, again, uh, lies south of the Uintah Mountains. The central portion of the basin has an elevation of 5,000 to 5,500 feet, just about a mile above sea level. And Skinwalker Ranch sits in a very flat part of this massive basin. Nearby, a little nine-mile-long Dry Gulch Creek provides most of the ranch's irrigation water. The ridgeline directly behind Skywalker Ranch is known as Werewolf Ridge. Mm-hmm. Why? Who knows? Probably because they, people had a bunch of werewolves running around there at one point. Seems fitting. Locals say the actual reason is lost to history. Okay, now that we have a little bit of a lay of the land, let's head to the beginning of the Skinwalker Ranch story by diving headfirst into this week's alien and cryptid-filled Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck timeline. 12,000 BCE. That's when we think the first people who may have already been contacting skinwalkers moved into the area where the ranch now sits. At least two Paleo-Indian cultural sites uh, dating b- uh, between 12,000 BC and 8,500 BC have been located in the Uintah Basin. These people primarily hunted mammoth, bison, other big game. Maybe some skinwalkers hunted them. We don't know. During the archaic period of 8,500 BCE to 2,500 BCE, the basin was occupied by plateau archaic people people composed of various groups, tribes, and bands, most of uh, which uh, no one knows a whole hell of a lot about. Uh, People who are hunter-gatherers, one of these early groups of people were the Fremont people, a people whose culture predates the area's Navajo and Ute peoples. The Fremont people began to incorporate farming into their hunter and gatherer lifestyles. This meant they had to stay put, tend to their crops, so the people of the Fremont culture began to live in semi-subterranean shelters called kivas. Anthropologists and archaeologists have theorized that the Fremont people's social structure was likely composed of small, loosely organized bands consisting of several families. Along with the Kivas, the Fremont peoples also created clothing, pottery, and paintings, and they may have left behind the first documented portrayal of skinwalkers. Some Fremont people petroglyphs were found, rock art, some rock art, depicting two upright figures with rectangular upper bodies and extended arms. The figure in the center of the drawings has what appears to be the ears of a canine, while the figure to the right, uh, the, their ears noticeably absent. Archaeologists later named these engravings the Buckhorn Draw Pictograph Panel, and they're located in the San Rafael Swell in central Utah, 184 miles from Skinwalker Ranch. And these engravings uh, and, and other Fremont pictographs, I gotta say, they are pretty creepy. They're pretty eerie. Uh, the figures drawn are definitely humanoid, but they also don't look human. And it looks like the artist was capable of drawing a human if they wanted to, I mean, they're, they're really cool drawings or, you know, cool carvings, engravings, uh, paintings, however you want to, you know, call it. Uh, but they don't look, yeah, they don't look like humans. And this has led some to think that not all the figures drawn are supposed to be humans. Some think they're supposed to be skinwalkers. Uh, I should probably tell you what a skinwalker is now. We briefly discussed this creature in the Wendigo suck. And I covered a lot of this info in the skinwalkers episode of Scared to Death for our Creeps and Peepers over there. Uh, if you haven't heard of either uh, of those podcast episodes, here's a little refresher. A skinwalker is a creature that A, can walk. Skinwalker is super good at walking. I cannot stress that enough. Like, you might think you walk really good. And maybe, you know what, maybe you do. I don't know you. Maybe it's been a long time since you stumbled. Maybe it's been a long, you know, several years. I don't know, since you were just walking and just kind of fell down randomly. And so you think, I walk really good. Well, I've got news for you. Cocky, look how good I walk. Skinwalkers walk better. So that's one thing. And B, they have a lot of skin. Some would say too much. You know, their skin is thicker than your skin. It's looser, uh, like a Sharpe or a Pug or a Bull Mastiff or maybe like a Basset Hound. So there you go. Uh, That's pretty much it. Uh, They walk good and they have, you know, quite a bit of skin. Moving on. Uh, JK, what a disappointing and incredibly vague and unsatisfying description that would be. Uh, That's the kind of description that someone like Roy Head of the Illuminati Disney would write, not me. Allow me to start over. While many tribes of the American Southwest tell legends of the Skinwalker, these stories seem to originate in the legends and oral history of the Navajo tribe. So we'll go with the Navajo description. The Skinwalker has been translated from a Navajo word that translates to, by means of it, it goes on all fours. The Navajo Skinwalker is essentially the opposite of a medicine man. Someone who uses their magical powers uh, for healing with a medicine man, 
the Skinwalker uses their their magical powers for for bad for bad stuff. The skinwalker is someone who broke Navajo cultural taboos so significantly they became a literal monster. Very similar in this respect to original Wendigo lore. The Skinwalker is someone who once pursued the healing arts, but at some point were lured by black magic and the art of making others ill to satiate their own bloodlust and hunger. Kind of like Darth Vader. Like Darth Vader, they realized the power of the dark side. They, they went with the fucking emperor. They stepped out of the light and into the darkness. Most often a man, but at times a woman or child. The Skinwalker, really type of, a type of a witch, has the ability to transform into an animal, uh, usually a bear, wolf, or eagle, as it suits them. Once in animal form, the skinwalker attains the skills and attributes of that animal, but heightened to a supernatural level. They have better hearing, better eyesight, probably bigger wings and balls and vagina stuff. I don't know. And according to most legends, the ability to travel by supernatural means. This nightmare of a beast is often described as very tall with glowing red eyes, sharp teeth. A person becomes this hideous creature, again, when they commit the worst of deeds, you know, uh, you know, they, they some go against some huge, you know, cultural taboo, like uh, like killing a sibling, killing another family member, uh, and then they surrender their humanity. Super Wendigo-esque in this respect. Some think these two cryptids are actually the same creature. Uh, once transformed into beast form, a skinwalker's bloodlust intensifies, increases, unable to enter the homes of its victims. For some magical reason, the skinwalker will mimic the voices of children or loved ones to lure victims outside to attack them and feast upon them. According to legend, the skinwalker can even possess a person invading their mind to drive them to insanity or violence. They have all kinds of creepy powers that vary a little from telling to telling. If they're, if they're real, you never want to encounter one. You're never going to leave a skinwalker encounter and think, you know what, that guy's super cool. What a nice, friendly, not threatening at all skinwalker. <laughs> I can't wait to see that little skinwalker again. Oh, <laughs> what, a fun little, what a doll of a creature. Uh, while in human form, said that a skinwalker can be recognized by their animal-like eyes and twitchy mannerisms. Another part of the skinwalker legend that I uh, do not believe I mentioned before on any podcast episode is that it's believed that if an intended victim sees a skinwalker's face and can identify the earthly man or woman who is transformed into a monstrous witch, the human must be killed, or the skinwalker will die themselves. So a skinwalker who thinks they've been recognized will return to kill the one they think can identify them. According to this part of the lore, once you've spotted a skinwalker, it's simply a matter of time before they kill you, right? Or you kill it. So, using some deductive reasoning here, it's obviously best to immediately kill anyone you, you think just might be a skinwalker. I mean, right? Come on, just to be safe. If anyone seems just a little twitchy or animalish or smells maybe kind of musky or, or suddenly makes a sound that you can interpret as a, as a bestial growl or a bark or a howl of some kind, or, or maybe even like the caw of a bird of prey. Just caw, 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 caw. You, 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 gotta, you gotta fucking put them down. You gotta put them down right now. Wake up, idiot! It's you or them! There isn't a jury on earth who's gonna convict you if you just tell them, yeah, sure, now I understand that Bob was not a skinwalker. It was in fact just a normal high school English teacher clearing his throat while throwing down a bacon cheeseburger at Carl's Jr. during his lunch break, but at the time, I felt like my life was in danger. When he looked at me, he gave me a real kind of timber wolfish fucking skinwalker vibe. And of course, I'm kidding. You, you know that, right? If you thought I wasn't kidding and you were prepared to start killing, uh, I want you to push pause and I want you to please set up a counseling appointment immediately. Uh, I'm worried about you. We all are. We're all worried about you. Your, your family's worried. We're worried. Uh, tell me you want to talk to someone because you almost started killing strangers that you thought might be skinwalkers. Uh, back to the timeline. Uh, from 1300 CE to the beginning of uh, European arrival in the New World, the Uinta Basin was occupied primarily by the Ute, the Paiute, and the Shoshone, each having arrived as early as 1000 CE. Each tribe would eventually develop their own skinwalker-related lore. Uh, on July 29th, 1776, jumping quite a bit ahead now, the first white men to set foot in the Uinta Basin were Franciscan members of a small Spanish expedition from Santa Fe, headed by Silvestre uh, Velez de Escalante and Francisco Antanasio Dominguez. Uh, these intrepid explorers and priests opened the Uinta Basin and the eastern portion of the Great Basin to Spanish, later Mexican, American, and British fur trappers and traders. Uh, with the arrival of the Spaniards in the New World, the Ute were introduced to the horse, which they initially viewed as little more than a large dog. I love it. <laughs> Can you imagine what the first tribe members were thinking when they saw these horses? Right when their frame of reference is dogs, thinking that they were just big dogs, right? They had dogs derived from like wolves and coyotes. Dogs no more than maybe 130 pounds. All of a sudden, these 700, 800 pound horse dogs show up, just in their head, just like God damn, that's a big ass dog with super long neck hair. 
How the hell these guys feed these things? What, they feed that dog other dogs? What the fuck is going on? Uh, soon the Ute would obtain horses of their own and trade with the Spaniards, learn to ride them, ultimately use the animals to conduct raids on Navajo villages and against other tribes in the region. They didn't battle much with the Spaniards because the Spaniards never created much of a, a settlement presence on their lands. The primary objective of the, of the raids the Utes uh, went on using their new horses was slave trading. The Utes brought, uh, or brought Navajo prisoners south into New Mexico to be sold or traded. And, and this is when the legend of the Skinwalker makes its way into Ute lore. Around this time, the Utes' oral history begins to describe being attacked by skinwalkers, monsters who were once people driven to the brink of their sanity. The Ute believed that the skinwalkers were the Navajos' revenge for their slave trading raids. Between the late 1820s and 1840, uh, Whitey shows up and tries to stay. Two semi-permanent trading posts are established in the basin, Fort Ro uh, Robodeau, uh, Robodeau, sometimes referred to as Fort Uinta or Fort Winty, that lasted until 1844. Not a lot of pronunciation guides on this fort because no one gives a shit about it. So it didn't last very long. Uh, the Utes burned it down. So it's a couple years after it uh, you know, was built. Uh, there was also Fort Kit Carson, founded in 1833. Also didn't last long, gone by the next year. The Utes had beaten Whitey off their lands for the most part, but they'd soon be back, and this time to stay. In the early 19, uh, 19, in the early 1860s, <laughs> Brigham Young, that'd be awesome if they showed up in the 1960s. What a very different story that would be. If they're like, ah, this, we found this land, and it's already, oh shit, there's a lot of people here. Okay, a lot of cities and stuff. Uh, in the early 1860s, Brigham Young, you may recall his pretty famous name from the Mormonism suck, ordered a small expedition to the Uinta Basin to determine if the area was suitable from Mormon settlement. Upon the expedition's return, Salt Lake City's Deseret News, established way back in 1850, published an article stating that the expedition found little there and that the basin was, quote, vast, a vast uh, conti contiguity of waste, valueless, excepting for nomadic purposes, hunting grounds for Indians, and to hold the world together. <laughs> I like those last five words. Brigham, is the land good for settlement? No. The land is good for nothing more than to hold the world together. The land is little better than a barren void where one could step off the earth and descend into a featureless and lifeless pit of nothingness. It is better than that, but not by much. Uh, in 1861, Abraham Lincoln, never heard of him, uh, set aside most of the Uinta Basin for American Indian Reservation. <laughs> Does the guy think he is, president? It was until the late 1860s. Uh, that most of the Utes resided in the Utah Valley and areas south were relocated to the reservation following increased levels of hostility between natives and white settlers. And then beginning in the early years of the 1870s, Mormon ranchers and other whites on the Indian reservation began filtering into Ashley Valley, only 30 miles east of Skinwalker Ranch, an area that served as an excellent summer feeding ground for herds of cattle. Damn Whitey move, moves the natives to a different reservation and then moves into that reservation just a decade later. Uh, the relationship between the American Indians and the Utah Territory and the Mormon settlers were, was complicated. And as the Mormons began to expand their settlements throughout the rest of the territory and onto more and more native land, it only got more difficult. And by difficult, I mean the local tribes wished the Mormon settlers would fuck off and never come back. And the Mormon settlers were like, no, I don't want to. You can't, you can't make us. In 1898, after a variety of skirmishes between white settlers and tribes, after a few smaller reservations have been established in the area. Another reservation, the Uncompagre Indian Reservation, was open to both miners and settlers in 1898. Uh, I think I, I already said 1898, but you know, I just want to make sure. Uh, the Uncompagre Indian Reservation became more commonly known as the Ure Reservation, which would eventually merge with the Uinta Valley Reservation, which had been created back in 1861. And this new reservation is now called the Vast Uinta and Ure American Indian Reservation that I mentioned earlier as the area surrounding Skinwalker Ranch. This is where things start to get real strange and paranormally. Uh, also in 1898, Congress designates 7,000 acres of Ute land as public domain, and by doing so, they inadvertently exempt that land from any official control or law enforcement. As a result, saloons and brothels spring up. Their customers consist mainly of outlaws, miners, and soldiers from the nearby Fort Duchesne. In the evenings, as the soldiers return to the fort drunk and goofing around, they often pass by a ravine where they would throw their empty whiskey bottles. So many bottles are thrown in this ravine over a period of several years, it earns the name of Bottle Hollow. And the Bottle Hollow Ravine is now covered mostly by water from a nearby reservoir called, not surprisingly, Bottle Hollow Reservoir. And the Utes believe that Bottle Hollow Reservoir is inhabited by many large aquatic monster snakes, like really big cryptic, you know, cryptid large snakes. Fuck yeah. 
Second weird monster to be mentioned this timeline. We got skinwalkers, and now we got giant water snakes roaming around this suck, and we're just getting started. To this day, people continue to claim to witness strange shapes crawling around in the reservoir, especially near the marina. If you if you hate being attacked, like if you really hate being attacked by giant monster snakes, then you, you want to avoid swimming near the marina, most of all, in that reservoir. According to tribal police officers, an inordinate number of drowning cases occur in the reservoir. It's fucking damn snakes! We're dealing with a giant water snake epidemic. Everyone's worried about COVID. But what about the goddamn monster water snakes in Utah? What, are we just going to keep pretending that they're not eating people? That they're not eating the children? What about the children? Doesn't anyone care about the children anymore? Sorry, I'm done now. Uh, numerous witnesses have also reported seeing strange different colored lights going in and coming out of the water. What are those? Not sure. Maybe some of the giant snakes, uh, maybe they light up. You know, maybe some of them have teeny tiny little T-Rex like snake arms and they hold little flashlights because they're scared of the reservoir's murky dips. I don't, I don't know. I'm just spitballing. Seven years after public domain status is given to 7,000 acres around Bottle, Ho- Bottle Hollow Reservoir in August of 1905, thousands of potential homesteaders rushed to Grand Junction, Colorado into Vernal, Price, and Provo, Utah to register for a land drawing that would grant 160 acres to any male settler. Only a fraction of the people who register actually take up uh, the settlements. Two of the settlers who did take up settlements, John and Emma Myers, build a small homestead on the property that will become Skinwalker Ranch. Dun, dun, dun. Here we go. We've made it to the ranch. Uh, the property was located along the southern border of the Uintah and Ure American Indian Reservation, east of the Duchesne uh, Uintah County border. The nearest landmark was Bottle Hollow Reservoir, directly north of the ranch, Old Glow Snake Lake. North of the property was a large expanse of elevated land, primarily rock and stone outcroppings, and at least two small caves and a burial mound. So, a burial mound. So nice and spooky. It's a nice and spooky place. The same year, a family called the Locks moved to the west side of what will eventually become Skinwalker Ranch. And from 1906 to 1911, these first Skinwalker settlers, the Myers, claimed to hear underground rumblings and explosions day and night around the ranch. They never could determine the, the source of these noises. They couldn't find anything amiss on the land, never saw anything they could attribute the noises to. A journalist later speculated that the noises could be chalked up to simply the slipping of one layer of rocks over another uh, at some place along the Uintah Fault. Okay, maybe. Or maybe rumblings from an underground Lemurian city type skinwalker lair. Or that. Or snake tunnels. Giant water snake tunnels. Uh, in the summer of 1909, about 45 miles east of Skinwalker Ranch, near Jensen, Utah, a famous dinosaur quarry is first discovered by geologist Earl Douglas of the Carnegie Museum. Is that what those monster snakes are? Dinosaurs? Are we dealing with uh, some kind of Loch Ness monster leftover ancient creature type situation? Thousands of fossils would be unearthed at this site, adding to the uniqueness of this area. Adding further to this uniqueness, in 1915, a super weird visitor shows up on the Locke family's side of the ranch. Dude shows up out of nowhere, asks the family for a glass of water. He shows up with no horse, no means of transportation, nothing. He shows up in the middle of the high desert alone, asking for a glass of water. Making his odd visit weirder, the homesteaders notice that beneath his uh, totally normal for the time period kind of clothing, He's wearing a not normal for the time period blue sparkly outfit. This stands out to the Locke family because in rural 1915 Utah, not a lot of dudes wandering around the desert alone wearing blue sparkly undershirts. Some hardcore UFO theorists have come to refer to this guy as the traveler, as in the time traveler. He apparently had a lengthy conversation with the family and then just kind of walked off and disappeared forever. But before he left, the traveler told the Locks where not to dig on their property. Then he leaves. What in the hell? Is this guy mentally ill? Yeah, probably. Maybe. Uh, whatever he was dealing with. Strange count, strange encounter. Very strange encounter. Can you imagine if someone showed up at your door, just asked for a glass of water, then pointed to some patch of your yard and was like, don't ever dig there. You can dig over here. You can dig over there, closer to the road. But here, just to the left of that ponderosa pine. No, sir. Don't you ever dig there. Nah, much obliged for the water. I must be off. Uh, 1930, the first cattle mutilation occurs on the ranch that would years later become infamously linked with a ton of additional cattle mutilations. Christopher Locke, grandson of uh, some original Locke settlers, discovers a, a mangled cow on the property. Hmm. 1933, Kenneth and Edith Myers, the son and daughter-in-law of original Skinwalker Ranch homesteaders, John and Emma, buy a trailer and move on to the east side of the property. The Locks and their descendants still live on the west side. Even though up until this point in the ranch's history, there have been no recorded sightings of supernatural creatures or aliens, you know, other than that weird shiny blue shirt guy, 
Uh, many who live in the area are starting to think that something odd is going on at Skinwalker Ranch. A group of Ute living nearby allegedly established a betting circle where participants put money on the length of time the Myers would stay on the ranch before being driven away. By what? We don't know. A decade later, we have our first documented UFO sighting. Here we go. Two miles from Skinwalker Ranch, a large silver globe-like object is seen flying over Fort Duchesne in 1944. One of the witnesses told the following story of the encounter. I've, I've added some music. I've added some music to, to give it a little ambiance. Uh, hopefully make it more entertaining. Gonna, gonna add some music to uh, all of the longer first-hand account passages today. I hope it, hope it adds to the storytelling. When I was in my 30s, my mother told me a story. One day, we were having our little picnic lunch. Couldn't have been much of a lunch. There was a heavy wartime food ration in effect. A shiny object flew in from the west, made a circuit around the little meadow, hovered for a few minutes, then flew away to the east. I was surprised. I asked her why she'd never told me this story before, and she said she never considered the incident of much significance. I slapped her in the face and yelled, Damn it, woman! What do you mean? Not much significance. You saw a UFO. It doesn't get much more significant than that, does it? Answer me! Sorry, this slap stuff was Cummins bullshit. That was, that was not mine. That was not mine. Back, back to my story now. She could have been right, but I asked her to draw the object from memory. She drew a circular globe. That's it. A circular globe. I asked her if the object did anything but fly through the air. She tried to explain that it made some kind of jittery or shaky movements. She really couldn't describe what the movement was like. Hmm. I asked if the object could have been carried by the wind, but she didn't remember it being particularly windy that day. So it circled the little meadow and then flew away. This incident was several years before Kenneth Arnold's famous 1947 sightings of nine shiny objects that flew in tandem and skipped like saucers as they flew through the sky near Mount Rainier in Washington State. Years later, I met a man, a police officer, who had worked at Fort Duchesne. He told me of an incident where he and his family were laying out on the lawn one evening, as families do, drinking coffee and soft drinks, when a shiny object overflew their house, stopped and shot straight up. The officer couldn't identify what the object was, but it was enough to send the family scurrying into the house. The officer said that he and his family didn't go out in the evening like that for quite a while. Well, after Mom told me the story of the meadow siding, I gave it some thoughts. At least two possibilities came to me. As I said, Kenneth Arnold hadn't yet had his sighting experience, but I learned even in those pre-internet days that the Fort Duchesne area was kind of notorious for sightings of that kind. Or well, there was another possibility. During the war, the Japanese had made and released a number of Fugo hydrogen-filled balloons carrying incendiary devices from the Japanese homelands. Home islands, hoping the balloons would make their way west via the jet stream. I guess east, excuse me. <laughs> directions. I forget sometimes. Land. They hope they would land in America's forest lands and start forests or wildfires and maybe kill somebody. Whether the shiny object my mother saw was a flying saucer or a fugo bomb or something else, I certainly can't say. But here's what I can't say. My mother is a goddamn fool. There's no way around it. She saw a flying saucer and she didn't immediately make a journal entry or, or sketch a little note. Nothing. Why not? What, she had too much going on in Fort Duchesne, Utah, 1944? Get the fuck out of here. That place... Didn't have anything going on. It wasn't much more significant or interesting than watching paint dry. She blew it. You know it and I know it. And I'll never forgive her. Apologies again. Those, dis those disparaging remarks assigned to my sweet mother belong to Cummins. Of course, he's a filthy, heathen savage. And while God may be able to someday forgive him, I certainly never will. Please allow me now to finish my tale un uninterrupted. Here's what I can say about my mother's sighting. That little meadow is within two or three miles of the infamous Skinwalker Ranch. I don't know if the paranormal experiences, phenomena experienced in that ranch area were happening back as far as World War II. One certainly happened nearby on a picnic day in 1944. All right, so not an amazing story, but important to include it, uh, since it will add to a series of so many strange sightings around the ranch and establish that there were strange things in the sky being seen around the ranch uh, long before much more recent sightings would give the ranch its current notoriety. Uh, from this point on, it's going to be a steady series of reports of UFO, UFO sightings in the area. Uh, also, just before we move on, a few words about those Japanese Fugo hydrogen-filled balloons referred to. I had never heard of those things before this tale, and I did wonder for a second if that was just some made-up bullshit. Uh, no. Now, they were very real. 
such a strange weapon. From late 1944 until early 1945, the Japanese launched over 9,300 fire balloons, of which 300 were found or observed in the U.S. After American aircraft bombed Tokyo and other Japanese cities during the Doolittle Raid of 1942, the Japanese military command wanted to retaliate in kind, but its manned aircraft were incapable of reaching the west coast of the U.S. What the Japanese military lacked in technology, however, it made up for in geography. Since the 13th century, when a pair of cyclones foiled the fleets of Kublai Khan's Mongol invaders, the Japanese had long believed that the gods had dispatched divine winds, called kamikaze, to protect them. And then during World War II, the military thought the winds could save them once again when scientists discovered that a westerly river of air, uh, 30,000 feet high, known now as the jet stream, could transport hydrogen-filled balloons to North America in three to four days. So for two years, the Japanese military produced thousands of balloons with skins of lightweight but durable paper made from mulberry wood. Using 40-foot-long ropes attached to the balloons, the military mounted incendiary devices and 30-pound high explosive bombs rigged to drop over North America and spark massive forest fires that would instill panic and divert resources from the war effort. The forest fires never happened, but some weird tragedy did. On May 5th, 1945, one of these balloons killed some kids and a woman in Oregon. Uh, that Saturday, Reverend Archie Mitchell, at the time the pastor of the C and M.A. Church in Little Bly, Oregon, about 50 miles from Klamath Falls, led a Sunday school picnic up in the nearby mountains of Southern Oregon. Accompanying Mitchell uh, was his five months pregnant wife, Elsie, and five kids from the church. Mitchell drops off his wife and the kids for a hike, then drives the car up the road to meet them for lunch. As he's getting lunch ready, uh, one of the kids yells from the distance, says they found a balloon. Mitchell had actually heard of the Japanese fire balloons, yelled for the kid not to touch it. His yell comes too late. He hears the explosion and they all die except for Mitchell. Uh, they were the only American balloon casualties of the war. This poor dude loses his pregnant wife to a Japanese fire balloon that kills her in the woods of Oregon. What an incredibly random way to die. With my ridiculous sense of humor, if my wife, Lindsay, died in that way, fucking no one would believe me. No one would believe me at first. Hey, where's Lindsay? Oh, you, <laughs> you didn't hear? Uh, she, uh, she passed. What? Oh, my God. You're joking. Tell me you're joking. How? We were hiking in the woods. We were hiking in the woods, and she, uh, she touched a goddamn Japanese fire balloon. And it blew her the fuck up, Dave. What? Get out. Stop it, man. You're being ridiculous. No, you're being ridiculous. My wife was burnt to a crisp. By a Japanese fire balloon while we're on a hike in Oregon. What part of that's hard to understand? We were hiking in Oregon and she touched a Japanese fire balloon and it fucking blew her up. <laughs> that's, I can't think of a more random way to die. I know it's sad. <laughs> so anyway, is that what the storyteller's mom saw one of these fire balloons? I don't know. Maybe. We'll never know for certain. In the 1950s, Joseph Jr. Hicks an Altera High School and West Junior High science teacher in Fort Duchesne hears about this and some other early UFO sightings in the area. Hicks would become the first to try and gather evidence of paranormal happenings at Skinwalker Ranch and organize them in some type of empirical way. Uh, he was inspired by a group of his students who claimed to witness what could only be described as a UFO encounter over uh, uh, Skinwalker Ranch in 1951. About 30 of his students claimed to have seen a cigar-shaped UFO flying over them in broad daylight. And they weren't alone in experiencing this, or at least in claiming to. In the 1950s, the number of, of reports of UFOs around the basin soared. One newspaper reported that Dale Stone who was home for the weekend from Duchesne, reported to his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Avril Stone, that the account given in a Salt Lake City newspaper on the flying saucers was correct. Some 100 children of the Duchesne school watched the flying disc for about five minutes. He said it was shaped like two saucers placed together with two jet pipes extending behind. What? Uh, the Roosevelt Standard of Roosevelt, Utah, reported on Thursday, September 21st, 1950, when the old Rasmussen family was returning home Tuesday night after attending a genealogy meeting at Leota, they had quite an experience. They saw some of those flying saucers shooting through the sky. They are not sure what the things were, only that they were flying mighty fast and were pretty to see. In a hilariously titled article around the same time, uh, yep, there are flying saucers, we saw them also, a local barber named Pat Markey alerted some nearby day laborers to the presence of UFOs. The article read, and sure enough, floating over the Roosevelt toward, or floating over Roosevelt toward the south about 10 o'clock were several brilliant silver-colored objects. They were visible for perhaps five minutes before they finally vanished into the sky. It was no dream, folks. They were sure enough there because we all saw them. Some of these sightings would end up being explained away. Not all, but some, uh, some at least officially. The flying objects many witnessed would end up being identified. Another local newspaper bore the headline, Strange Object Proves Just to Be Army Flare. 
They wrote, the mystery can finally be resolved for the many Basin residents and travelers who viewed a strange fireball in the sky last Wednesday evening, July 1st. The witnesses included the Ollie Rasmussen family, tourists, Bud Davis, and many unidentified persons who called police chief Roe McDonald for information on the flaming ball. It was an army fire balloon flare, commonly used in military maneuvers to light the target area. As the witnesses reported, a parachute actually did emerge from the flare, but contrary to one report, there was no one in the parachute. Uh, some people, including Hicks, weren't convinced, though, that these crafts were just uh, army flares. Hicks' subsequent digging uncovered hundreds of firsthand accounts of UFOs and other strange phenomena occurring in and around Skywalker Ranch. He would eventually document more than 400 sightings of un unidentified crafts, witnesses to many of those sightings. Uh, many of these sightings also included supposed sightings of not just crafts, but actual extra extraterrestrial beings. Uh, sorry, I, I had a leftover little note there. Witnesses to many of these sightings of the, of the 400 also saw, excuse me, the extraterrestrial beings and cattle mutilations were occurring all the time. Now, when a UFO sighting was reported, a cattle mutilation would often quickly follow. Why were so many cattle being mutilated? Did aliens find out that you and Tom Basin cattle are the tastiest cattle on earth? Or was the area infested with cattle hungry skinwalkers? Uh, that actually is what some thought and what some still think. Um, some local American Indians uh, had been blaming cattle mutilations and other kinds of misfortune on skinwalkers for centuries. When Hicks contacted some local tribe members to collect more information about UFO sightings and subsequent cattle mutilations, he learned that many of these tribes believed that the area was uh, being damn near continuously prowled by skinwalkers who killed and ate cattle when they couldn't find human victims. The tribal members he spoke with referred to the whole region as the path of the skinwalker and many of them avoided certain parts of the basin at all costs. Uh, this is the first time that anyone had connected skinwalkers to UFOs in the area. Uh, Hicks eventually published his findings in a 1974 book entitled The Utah UFO Display. This book is unfortunately unavailable in ebook form and out of print at most online retailers. Found one copy, but I couldn't get it shipped here in time to read it before I had to record the episode. Its unavailability just adds to the mystery, I guess. In 1967, another wave of UFO sightings occurs in the Uintah Basin. It lasts until 1968. In 1970, the U.S. Army Corps uh, finishes uh, construction, Corps of Engineers finishes construction on the Bottle Hollow Reservoir. Those big-ass monster snakes that have been living in the Bottle Hollow ravine must have been pissed or super happy. Maybe they were sick of living in the high desert. Maybe they wanted to uh, take their laser light show into some cool water. Also in 1970, locals began to report increasing numbers of cattle mutilations in the Uintah Basin around the ranch. Okay, so maybe the snakes were pissed. Maybe they started eating some, uh, some cattle now because they were mad about the lake. Uh, in 1978, a Deseret News article discusses mass sightings of a UFO seen 10 miles from the ranch. The Deseret News wrote, area residents say that, ver at, say that at various locations and at times, they have witnessed the flight of an awesome dome-shaped unidentified flying object with intense lights. The first witness, a 13-year-old boy named Dale Wood, described the lights that surrounded the craft as intense green lights uh, jagged like the flames of a fire. The craft reportedly hovered slight, uh, silently directly over him before appearing to additional witnesses, including the boy's brother and mother. Mrs. Wood called the Ute Indian Tribal Police uh, in Fort Duchesne. Officer David Murray was dispatched to investigate the sightings, and then he also saw, said that he saw this object near US-40. So what the fuck? I know I've been fairly dismissive of a lot of UFO sightings in past sucks, but I am feeling more open to the possibility of some of these sightings being real recently. Just the sheer volume of sightings starts to really make me wonder. I mean, just in this example, even the officer called to the scene claims to have seen it. Why would all these people lie? And I do realize they could have all seen something at that su and, that, and that that something could have been something very much from this world, right? Uh, it could have been some object that just confused all of them. Or maybe aliens truly were filling the skies of the Uintah Basin in the mid 20th century. I hope so. Very exciting possibility to think about. Uh, and, and this particular sighting is made all the more interesting by the following information. The article goes on to say that the following day, Mrs. Wood talked to a reporter from the Roosevelt Standard named Tenta Rasmussen. The Rasmussens, they've been reporting seeing UFOs for years now. And this Mrs. Rasmussen told Mrs. Wood that while driving home from Roosevelt, she also spotted something out of the corner of her eye. She then asked her 10-year-old grandson, David, if the shining object was a plane. He replied calmly that it was a flying saucer. Mrs. Rasmussen then told Mrs. Woods that she was not afraid of the flying saucer because she'd seen a saucer-like object herself uh, 20 years earlier in the Neola area, so she knew what to expect. Then the Woods and Mrs. Rasmussen contacted Junior Hicks. Everyone has seen aliens. Or are they? 
We have tons of people now living in the same tightly knit community who are talking to each other about UFOs, claiming to see UFOs, building each other's stories up about UFOs over multiple generations. Are they all seeing UFOs or are they all, or are they all just really wanting to see UFOs? So they're not the only ones, you know, left out of the UFO party. Because who wants to be the only person not seeing UFOs in a rural area where everyone else is seeing UFOs or claiming to? At some point, would you just say that you saw a UFO for social acceptance? Let's talk for a second about crowd psychology. There is a widely accepted psychological theory about crowd about crowd psychology that addresses how different we meet sacks tend to act in a group versus how we act when we're by ourselves. Turkish social psychologist uh, Musafar Sharif, one of the founders of modern social psychology, demonstrated in a 1935 experiment the influence people have on one another's perceptions. He had a group of people observe a stationary light in a darkened room. Another stationary, or, or excuse me, although stationary, the light appeared to move and in a different and in a different direction to each observer. The members of the group were able to eventually reconcile their initially divergent perceptions and agree in which direction the light was quote unquote moving. So in short, they all agreed that they saw an object move in a direction that for many it was not moving. Well, it wasn't moving at all, was it? But but to many, it didn't even appear to be moving it. An ability to check one's perception with others and to get feedback is an important part of evolutionary biology. And one of the things that helps humans cooperate so they can build tools and form societies. Agreement can be very useful in society. But under some circumstances, feedback from others can lead to exaggerated or even faulty perceptions and mass hysteria. Like-minded people have also been clinically observed to reinforce each other's viewpoints uh, in a theory called group polarization. In a study by French psychologists Sergei Moscovici and Marisa Savaloni, researchers asked participants some questions. First, researchers asked about their opinion of the French president. Second, they asked about their attitude towards Americans. The researchers then asked the participants to discuss each topic uh, as a group. After the discussion, groups who held a tentative consensus became more extreme in their opinions the longer they talked. The researchers concluded group consensus seems to induce a change of attitudes in which subjects are likely to adopt more extreme positions. Basically, when we see our opinions reflected back to us, however uncertain or tentative those opinions might have been initially, the belief then strengthens and we can become more extreme in our beliefs. Combine these so social psychology uh, tendencies with the proven human ability to implant false memories that we've discussed in numerous past sucks, one could theorize that it is entirely plausible for an entire town to convince itself that everyone is seeing aliens. False memories are constructed by combining actual memories with suggestions received from others. During this process, individuals may forget the source of the information and disassociate the content of the memory from the source, leading people to convince themselves that they experienced something when they definitely did not. That effect was demonstrated in a study by Saul M. Casson and his colleagues at Williams College, who investigated the reactions of individuals falsely accused of damaging a computer by pressing the wrong key, a key they did not, in fact, ever press, for sure. The innocent participants initially denied the charge because they didn't do it, but when a lab assistant said that she had seen them perform the action, many participants relented and it said that, okay, I guess they did do it, signed a confession. The participants even gave extra details about how the computer broke that Cassin and his colleagues never even provided an entirely false memory. So bringing all this back to the Uintah Basin, um, you know, um, also worth pointing out that this area was and is heavily Mormon. Why is that important? How does that factor into all this? Because when, uh, I think it, it does factor in because when one opens uh, their mind to religious thinking, that mind is now not only open to believing in the possibility of things that cannot be seen or scientifically proven, the mind now definitely believes with certainty that these things exist. Things like angels, demons, and specifically in the Latter-day Saints belief system, a vast universe full of millions of other planets, all populated by other people, other people that you could define as aliens. And that person, I would think, is much more apt to convince themselves that sure, why not? They just saw a UFO than some uh, stone cold atheist. Now, is that what I think is going on here? I have no fucking idea. Uh, I hope not. I don't know any of these people. They could have seen aliens. Again, I wasn't there. Uh, or they could have convinced themselves that they did see aliens. We have to allow, allow for that possibility. Not a, not a fun thing to do all the times, but, uh, you know, I think you need to look at these stories with as much logic as possible. So I just wanted to play devil's advocate for a second for my skeptics listing. It's like, yes, there is, you know, these type of possibilities with these type of sightings. All right, back to the timeline now. In 1981, 
adding to the general atmosphere of what the fuck is happening out by Skinwalker Ranch, NASA builds a research observatory called the Vernal Site just 16 miles northeast of the ranch. Why there? What are they looking for? This site was eventually, and one could say mysteriously, abandoned. On April 26, 1987, Skinwalker Ranch owner Kenneth Myers passes away. His wife, Edith, leaves the ranch, which will now sit empty for seven years. As far as we know, I guess it's possible. We're going to talk about a lot of possibilities today. You know, a couple of skinwalkers could have squatted there during those seven years when other people weren't around. You know, just, 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 you know, just a remote possibility. But, you know, maybe they were just there chilling out, stealing some satellite signals, splicing into a neighbor's electricity so they could watch Murphy Brown in night court. Eating some Hungry Man Salisbury steak dinners. Maybe snacking on some easy cheese and chicken and a biscuit crackers. Maybe drinking some, some cold 7-Up Gold. Look it up, it's real. And just vibing, you know? Is that likely? No. I'm just throwing it out there as a possibility. I wasn't there and neither were you. Uh, March 3rd, 1994. Edith Meyer dies at 88. Her brother-in-law, uh, Garth Gardner Myers. Who gives their kid a middle name of Gardner when their first name is Garth? It's fucking terrible. Garth Gardner, Garth Gardner Myers, uh, inherits the ranch and sells it to, can you believe this shit? Roy Mom Eater Disney. Did he die in 1971? Did he? Were you there? Or plot twist. Hear me out. Is he a skinwalker who killed his own mother so he could feast on her flesh and then live in the woods? I am merely speculating, not accusing, which is well within my legal rights when referring to a public figure, Disney legal team, if you are listening. After Gar- Garth Gardner Myers inherits the ranch, he does not sell it to Roy Disney. And yes, I do realize that joke is probably only funny to me. He sells the ranch to people who will make it famous, the Shermans. Buckle up. The Shermans are going to take the weirdness in this story, crank it up to a fucking 11. In the summer of 1994, Terry Sherman. Oh, this, this guy. Oh, boy. Rancher and cattle breeder and his wife, Gwen, a banker, they find their dream ranch. The big 512-acre spread, a remote little paradise for the Shermans. It'd be a fine place, they thought, to raise their teenage son, a nine-year-old daughter. They were puzzled. Why such a prime piece of real estate had been sitting vacant for seven years? Terry would later say, there were some really odd things about the place we noticed right when we moved in. We should have known something was wrong. Dun, dun, dun. The first sign that something was off about the place were the large impressions that the Shermans kept finding in their pastures. Within just a few weeks of moving in, they claimed to have found a 30-foot triangle impression in one of their fields. As the weeks went by, they found other circles, measuring roughly three feet wide and one to two feet deep, with the soil inside the holes firmly pressed down. Terry also began having trouble with his cattle. Cows start turning up dead. Cows who seem to die under very strange circumstances. Getting more X-Files-ish now. I like it. Terry finds a hole in the center of the left eyeball of the first dead cow and no other wounds. And although it had been dead for days by the time Terry found it, predators and scavengers had not touched its carcass. Very suspicious. And Terry noticed a chemical smell in the vicinity. A short time later, a second cow is found dead with the same strange hole in its left eyeball. Overcome with curiosity, Terry claims he took a wire, inserted it into the hole of each of the cow's eyeballs to gauge the depth of the wound, and found that the wire passed easily all the way into, you know, deep into the cow's brains. So what could have done that and why? Soon after the death of these cows, Terry witnesses something much stranger. Oh boy, he has an encounter not with the corpse of an animal that had died in a way he couldn't identify. He has a very strange encounter with a living creature whose species he cannot identify. He thinks he encountered a skinwalker when it was in the form of a strange, menacing super wolf. And I'm going to share his story, his account, uh, that also needs a little bit of of music to give it some mood. Not long after moving into Skinwalker Ranch, Terry was hard at work in one of the fields when he saw some movement out of the corner of his eye. He turned to see a large dog-like creature at the distance. It was walking in his direction. And he immediately tried to figure out what could it be. A dog? A coyote? Maybe even a wolf? As he came closer, Terry realized that the creature was far bigger than any dog or wolf. It was roughly, I don't know, Roy Disney sized. <laughs> JK. Before he knew what was happening, the creature had covered the entire distance between them and trotted right out in front of Terry. The animal seemed peaceful, maybe even tame. Terry couldn't help but reach out his hand to pet it. As one does when one encounters a large, unknown apex predator. He ran his hand through its gray fur, feeling the powerful musculature below. Not making this shit up. Shortly after Terry touched it, the beast turned around and ran away from him, shooting off like a thunderbolt. 
heading straight toward the corral in which the Shermans kept their cattle. Before Terry could shout out, the creature stuck its monstrous wolf snout through the bars of the cattle pen and clamped its powerful jaws onto the head of the calf closest to it. Gripping the calf's head with its long, jagged teeth, the creature began attempting to pull the baby cow through the bars as it screamed in pain. Terry ran to the cattle pen. As he reached the creature, he delivered several blows with his fist to the beast's ribcage. Totally normal thing to do to a large, aggressive predator trying to eat, you know, something. You punch it with your man fists. When his bare hands had no effect on the creature, Terry grabbed a nearby baseball bat and began to beat the creature with it over and over again. Apparently this thing was taking a really long time getting that calf. Or Terry just happened to have a baseball bat just laying around in a cattle pen. Anyway, the bat like his fist was useless. Ignoring Terry altogether, the beast continued its attempt to pull the crying calf to the bars of its holding pen. How the fuck is this calf still alive? Terry yelled out to his son, Tad, Get my magnum! And his confused son then quickly brought his father a large condom. Ah, JK, just a little condom joke there. No, Terry kept the heavy-duty magnum handgun in the glove compartment of his truck. Tad quickly brought the weapon to his father, and Terry shot at the creature once, twice, three times, but the bullets had no effect. What startled Terry even more was that his shots left no visible wounds or blood. It wasn't until the fourth shot at point-blank range that the creature finally let go of the calf, seemingly more out of sheer annoyance than anything else. The bleeding calf scrambled to the other side of the corral. What the fu- How is this still alive? I'm more impressed by this calf than I am by this skinwalker wolf. And the creature turned his attention to Terry's gla- its gaze. Not glaze. He didn't have a glaze gaze. He had a regular gaze. and It was flat and predatory. I bet. I bet it was. He punched it. You know, shot it and hit it with a bat. Terry aimed his gun at the creature's chest and fired. It was a direct hit, but the creature only turned around and began to walk away at a slow, uh, leisurely pace for some reason. Terry yelled for his son to bring him his shotgun. As the creature walked into the distance, Terry opened fire again. Must have been really leisurely walking away into the distance. He has a lot of time to, to grab shit in this story. Terry could hear the 12-gauge bullet ripping through the thing's shoulder. Why is he shooting bullets with his trolleys? Should be pellets, but whatever. It only paused briefly before continuing at the same pace. Terry let off another round, hitting it in the chest. This time, Terry could clearly see blood spraying out of the open wound, but the animal didn't seem to be in any pain. Terry and Tad were desperate to stop it. They followed it into the woods, which is, you know, what you do when you're fighting a monster, and then lost sight of it after it entered the trees. You could see its fresh tracks in the mud and followed it more until the tracks vanished in the middle of the woods as though the creature had disappeared into thin air. Get the fuck out of here! No, no, no! This did not happen. Come on. Who sees a giant wolf, a wild wolf, and starts petting it? No one. No one does that. But you know what? Let's say Terry does do that. Let's say the skinwalker puts a spell on him and he, and he, and he does do that. He pets it for some reason. And then the skinwalker tries to take a calf and Terry runs over and starts punching it? No. Why would he do that? Why would he risk his life to save a calf he is raising specifically for the purpose of having it slaughtered for its beef meat in a few years? This is the dumbest shit I've ever heard. I will believe in skinwalkers and aliens long before I will believe a rancher who clearly has at least two loaded guns nearby runs over and starts punching a fucking wolf monster to get it to let go of a calf and then runs and grabs a bat instead of grabbing one of the guns. Terry Sherman, if you're listening and this is true, you may be the dumbest motherfucker I've ever read about. I realize that I've given a terrible first impression of the Shermans, but you know, it is what it is. You can't tell the story of the Skinwalker Ranch and skip over the Shermans portion of it. It's, you know, and, and their portion begins with that story, which I did find very funny. Just what are you, what? Thank God others' accounts come across as more credible than uh, Sherman accounts. Uh, this was the Sherman family's first run-in with what they would uh, come to know as a Skinwalker. Uh, but the claim, uh, they claim it wouldn't be their last. And they, were, they would report many other unexplainable phenomena. Of course they would. I mean, wh- why stop? Why stop? If you've taken things to the level of punching skinwalkers, you're not just going to suddenly stop telling stories. Uh, their next report uh, has to do with the sky. In particular, a section of sky right over a wooded grove that they said would change come evening. Right when the sun was going down, an odd-looking orange smudge would appear just above the treetops. The Shermans felt like something was weird about this smudge. Shermans claimed that if they looked closely, they could almost look through the smudge to what appeared to be another sky. <laughs> they seemed to be looking down at a tunnel and speculated that this tunnel existed outside of space and time. Logical conclusion. 
Terry theorized that strange creatures that he had seen on the ranch were coming from this tunnel. <laughs> Once staring at the tunnel through the scope of his rifle, Terry sees a large black triangle-shaped craft fly out of the interdimensional doorway. Did anyone test this ranch for some kind of fucking gas leak? Not even trying to make another Roy Disney joke here. Like, what is going on with his family? By April 1995, the weirdness had escalated dramatically, I'll say. While checking his cattle one evening, Terry now claims he saw a glowing object uh, excuse me, pass over one of the fields. A few days later, his wife Gwen sees another object in the sky. She would later say, it looked like headlights, but they were a little ways away from the craft. It just lit the whole side of the mountain up like it was broad daylight. Then the Sherman's cow started vanishing. Uh, Terry would later claim, we contacted everyone around. We looked everywhere. They just vanished. Clearly, whatever was taken, it was not the skinwalker he punched. That thing couldn't even drag off a calf. Uh, in one instance, Terry followed tracks in the fresh snow, hoping that they would lead him to his cow. The track stopped under some trees at the edge of a field, the area around the animal's last steps, surrounded by a circle of twigs and branches from the trees above. Weird little, weird little, like, uh, like a Blair Witch Project type thing happening. Uh, the Shermans also observed many different kinds of crafts. Sure, why not? Uh, the most spectacular aerial phenomenon they observed was described by Terry. We could see these 100-foot circular openings appear in the air. It was like four orange-colored doorways would sort of just spiral open, okay? Uh, the Shermans would watch small crafts emerge from the hovering portals, fly around their property, and then just re-enter the doorways and disappear. The Shermans described these stealthy smaller crafts as being about 60 by 40 feet, you know, in size with a square short wings, and they uh, emitted spikes of light, which would hit the ground. <laughs> was someone just constantly putting LSD in their fucking well or something? The, the Shermans theorized of some kind of navigation system. Okay, okay. Uh, you would think that these people would start carrying a camcorder around at this point, you know, with all this stuff going on. Weird that they didn't do that. Uh, once their son, Tad, found a mutilated cow within five minutes of its death, Tad said he'd seen Angus the cow eating peacefully and then returned moments later to find it dead. And the cow's rectum, he noticed, had been cored out. Eek! Where its rectum should have been, there was a hole uh, about eight inches deep, about, about fist-sized in circumference. Tad never told anyone how, you know, he got those butthole measurements and no one ever asked. You know, can you imagine? Dad, something tore out one of our cow's buttholes when they killed it. The hole is eight inches deep. Easy. I was able to stick my hole erect. I, it was, I think it was eight. I don't know how deep exactly. Forget about it. Check on the cow. Uh, during the summer, uh, that summer, Terry, Tad and Terry's nephew also heard unintelligible voices while standing in a nearby pasture. Uh, the sound, which they first assumed to be the echoes of a CB radio seemed to emanate out of the air directly above them. They could hear two voices speaking an unknown speaking an unknown language that Terry described as choppy and sounding like a cross between Russian and American Indian. <laughs> okay, uh, one voice was deep and the other was high pitched. Terry yelled into the air, "We can hear you!" And then the voices stopped momentarily, and the deeper voice broke broke out into a low rumbling laugh. And then the two voices just continued speaking as before. Was somebody just fucking with Terry? That's the vibe I'm getting now. Like Terry's crazy. Everyone in the area had to know that Terry Sherman was batshit crazy. And, and I wondered, like, were local kids just starting to mess with him? Just like, dude, come on, it'll be fun. Now we'll hide behind the barn, and we just whisper in weird voices. And you watch, he'll freak out. I promise. Last week, we flew, like, a remote-controlled helicopter on his house. He's still talking about being attacked by some kind of spaceship. Uh, by the fall, strange activity is occurring daily, if not hourly, around the ranch. One night, Gwen claims to see lights in the field, so she grabs her binoculars. Not a camera. Uh, binoculars. Uh, she's shocked to see a square lighted structure sitting on the ground. Before the lights blink out, uh, Gwen says she catches a glimpse of a large, heavy set individual seated inside the structure. I love it. You never hear about fat aliens. Of course, the Shermans would see one. Short time later, the same craft appeared again. This time, Gwen and Terry both see it. Terry describes a person as being over seven feet tall and decked out in a totally black uniform and very huge. The, Sh <laughs> the Shermans note that the being appears to have a visor something shiny on its face a visor it's like some weird 90s frat guy 90s frat basketball guy getting out of a spaceship what's up bros what's up nice what are you guys watching for aliens nice uh the family starts noticing glowing blue balls around the property that appear to scan members of the family whenever they approach him my god these guys they don't want to quit they just keep up in the ante and, and then an alien just uh, just just popped into my plane of existence right in front of me yeah no we all saw it poof he was right there. And uh, that's not, hey, no, don't, don't lose focus. Don't, you know, keep, keep giving me attention. Don't look away now. This is just the start of it. Because he, he didn't just poof into existence. He started uh, uh, juggling. Yep, 
He is not not just three balls. No, he's he's juggling a thousand balls at once. Wait, did I say balls? Chainsaws. He was juggling a thousand chainsaws while levitating. And then another alien showed up and started shooting him out of the air, like with some like a like a Wild West alien show. While blindfolded. <laughs> wow, it's fucking crazy. After talking about being scanned, the Shermans claim the aliens then killed their dogs. Yeah, it just keeps getting weirder. Uh, their dogs went missing for several days. Terry and Gwen go looking for them in the woods. And then Terry spots three enormous circles carved into the ground. And in the center of each circle, he discovers a greasy blob of what looks to be shortening or butter. And he's positive, excuse me, this substance is whatever is left of his dogs. The dogs had been butterized. Damn you, aliens. Damn you, dog butterizing bastards from hell. Uh, the butterized dogs were the final straw for Gwen and Terry. I get it. You know, you got to draw a line somewhere. And for the Shermans, it was butterized dogs. Uh, feeling that they could no longer guarantee the safety of their children, they called it quits. Thank God. I'm ready to move past these idiots. Got to get back to some sightings that at least feel somewhat credible. Uh, the Shermans spend their last day on the ranch rounding up their cattle. When night falls, they lock all their doors, see their children to bed. Gwen and Terry take hot showers, fall into a deep sleep. And the next morning, they wake up to find their bedding covered in blood. Of course they do. <laughs> they both have a one-eighth inch deep scoop mark in the same place on their right thumbs. The ranch from hell had managed to get them one last time. The Shermans end up selling their ranch to Las Vegas millionaire, some say billionaire, Robert Bigelow, who in recent years uh, has invested substantial amounts of money into UFO-related research. Robert, a.k.a. Bob, a.k.a. Bobbert, is an interesting fucking character in a suck full of interesting characters. Let's meet Bobbert. Bobbert Bigelow, born in Vegas, 1945, always had an interest in science, which he attributed to having witnessed at age 12 a bunch of the atomic tests conducted at the, at the Nevada National Security Site, known in the 1950s as the Nevada Test Site, about 60 files, 65 miles excuse me, northwest of Vegas. Young Robert Bobbert saw mushroom clouds uh, from atmospheric testing, including one of the most well-known, which occurred when the site dropped a one-kiloton TNT bomb on Frenchman Flat on January 25th, 1951. A lot of people saw that one. The explosion could be seen over 100 miles away. Uh, another experience led to a fascination with extraterrestrials. When he was young, he heard a story from his grandparents about driving down from Mount Charleston, a 12,000-foot mountain just 10 miles outside of Vegas, and then they saw something in the air. His grandparents were positive it was a UFO. Robert's curiosity was permanently piqued. He decided he wanted to establish his own space program someday. Driven by that goal, he set out to accumulate the necessary wealth, dedicating himself to his education, later to numerous business ventures. After graduating high school, he enrolled at the University of Nevada where he studied banking and real estate. Over the next three decades, he dedicated himself to commercial real estate, primarily to the development of hotels, motels, and apartment complexes. He had a company called Budget Suites of America, still has it, uh, made a shitload of money on these uh, cheap motels. There are currently 19 locations in Arizona, Nevada, and Texas. In 1995, Bigelow used some of that budget hotel bread to found the National Institute for the Discovery of Science, NIDS. Uh, Bigelow's goal was to study paranormal events purely from an unbiased and authentic scientific angle using the brightest minds and the latest technology. He especially wanted to study UFOs and what better place to do that than Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, Zach Van Eyck, a journalist writing for the Salt Lake City Deseret News, once referred to Bigelow as easily the most prominent American financier in the paranormal research field. And in September of 1996, Bob Knob Job Bigelow buys Skinwalker Ranch for just $200,000. As part of the deal, the Shermans sign a non-disclosure agreement, which bars them from making any further statements about the ranch or their experiences. Yeah, good call. He probably wanted them to just shut the fuck up. So in case he saw something, he'd have a chance to be taken seriously. Stop poisoning the paranormal well, you idiots. You've already said way too much. Uh, Bigelow turned Skywalker Ranch into a paranormal research laboratory. He had employees post keep out signs, put fences around the ranch, lock the gates, uh, he put in an observation tower and hired a pair of scientists as well as a veterinarian. Bigelow had his employees send out 1,200 letters to local ranchers asking for their cooperation in reporting missing or mutilated animals. As Van Eyck noted in one of his articles, some researchers claim that Bigelow and NIDS were a front for CIA activities. More mystery. These theories fueled by the addition of retired Army Colonel John Alexander to the NIDS staff. Alexander had recently left his position as director of non-lethal weapons testing at Los Alamos National to join forces with Bigelow. So he's getting some big guns. As Wired Magazine reported in 1980, or 1995, Alexander had a resume lifted from the X-Files. Nice. I like it. Now that the shithead Shermans are gone, this crazy train is getting kind of back on the tracks. 
1996, the ranch gains notoriety in UFO and conspiracy theory circles when investigative reporter George Knapp writes a series of articles about the ranch that are published in the Deseret News. On January 21st, 1997, Terry Sherman discovers young cows near the observation center with strange wounds to their eyes and ears. Damn it! Yes, Terry Sherman, he's back. He never left, actually. God damn it. Bobbert Bigelow hired Terry Tall Tales to work as a ranch hand after he sold the ranch. Anyways, uh, you know, he, I guess he, he probably wanted to keep Terry just in case some wolves showed up, you know, and he needed somebody to punch him. Terry summons two veterinarians. Uh, the first vet took one look at the injuries, declared that they were unlike anything he had ever encountered before. But then the next veterinarian, a more experienced veterinarian, uh, strenuously disagreed. He insisted that the wounds had been made by a coyote or a wildcat. Whatever their origin, the mutilations only increase after this point. One calf appears to have been torn open by something insanely powerful, but also incredibly precise. One leg ripped off at the joint, all its internal organs removed with laser precision. It was completely drained of blood, one ear neatly severed from its head. Uh, Bigelow's NIDS has a, has a real and active predator on their hands, and they're sure this predator is paranormal. At least everyone is except, except for the experienced vet. He's like, no, I, I still think it's, it's probably coyotes. And then everyone else is like, shut the fuck up, Dr. Killjoy! Stop killing our X-Files vibe! We're trying to surf the, the fun wave that Terry Tall Tales has gotten going. Uh, in August 1997, the NIDS crew witnesses something highly unusual, even by the standards of Skinwalker Ranch. It's three in the morning, and two scientists named Mike and Jim, they're manning an observation post for several hours when they see an unknown light shining in the distant darkness. Uh, what are these scientists' last names? What type of science uh, do they have degrees and experience in? D it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Source doesn't say and doesn't need to. Mike and Jim are two very reputable scientists manning a skinwalker observation post in remote Utah who don't have surnames. It all checks out. If Madonna doesn't need a last name, if one name is good enough for Sting and Cher, well, it's good enough for Mike and Jim. The two men set up a camera on a tripod to capture the strange light. As the camera automatically snaps pictures every 30 seconds, Mike peers out at an anomaly through a pair of night vision binoculars. As the scientist stares in disbelief, the light turns into a circular portal or tunnel. Moments later, Mike shouts in shock, Jesus Christ, something is in the tunnel. He sees a large creature tumble out of the portal and screams, oh my God, it just climbed out. With no binoculars of his own, Jim can't see the beam. For fuck's sake, Jim, are you new? Is this the first time you've ever scienced? If you want to see a monster alien bean thing climb out of a flashing vortex tunnel, everyone knows you got to use your binoculars. I'm so sorry about Dr. Jim ruining this part of the story for everyone, you guys. All Jim could see was a swirling vortex of light that shrunk and seemed to collapse in on itself. Mike would later say that it seemed like the portal was open for just long enough for something to tumble out. Despite Mike's startling testimony, none of the NIDS equipment is able to pick up hard evidence of what he was talking about. Ah, bummer. 1998. Another mutilation takes place. NIDS investigates the cow's remains and finds that the mutilation is performed with a sharp surgical instrument once again. Despite spending $10,000 to analyze some of the cow's tissue, the results come back and say that there's nothing paranormal. It was just probably a predator. And they're like, ah, fuck, God dang it. June 25th, 2000, something actually interesting happens. A witness not named Terry Sherman or Dr. Jim calls NIDS to report a UFO sighting in the skies of southeast uh, or southeast of Fort Duchesne, headed in the direction of Randlett a little census-designated place about six miles southeast of Fort Duchesne. The caller describes the object as spherical-shaped and, get this, approximately the size of four football fields. That's huge. This is almost some Independence Day shit. The object is uh, emanating a constant glow with an intermittent flashing of a separate light source and making some kind of rhythmic sound. So there's that. No pictures, unfortunately. Uh, by 2011, Bobbert Budget Billionaire Bigelow and NIDS have up to 15 scientists and PhDs now working at any one time at the ranch. By then, Colonel Alexander has been replaced by Dr. Colm uh, Kelleher as deputy administrator. Uh, Kelleher was an expert in the field of cell and molecular biology, having earned his PhD in biochemistry from Holy Trinity in Dublin. And I got to say, I do like this guy. He doesn't seem too wacky. In one interview about what NIDS does, he says, we don't study aliens, we study anomalies. And when Terry Sherman read that interview, he probably mumbled to himself, no, Dr. Kelly, we, we punch skinwalkers. We punch skinwalkers. Uh, Kelleher, uh, along with George Knapp, the television journalist, would author the book, Hunt for the Skinwalker, Science Confronts the Unexplained at a Remote Ranch in Utah. And I will say that this book, which I mentioned earlier, one of the uh, four main sources, uh, very well rated. A lot of reviews. Not that craziness can't be well reviewed and rated. 
But, but you know, worth pointing out. According to Kelleher and Knapp, they saw or investigated evidence of close to 100 incidents that included vanishing and mutilated cattle, sightings of unidentified flying objects or orbs, large animals with piercing yellow eyes that witnesses said were not injured when struck by bullets, skinwalkers, invisible objects emitting destructive magnetic fields, all kinds of shit. The book was published in 2005. Uh, the following story about one of the incidents that happened in this uh, in this book occurred in the spring of 2004. The witness has chosen to remain anonymous. And again, I feel like some more uh, mood music is definitely appropriate to make this more just kind of spooky and entertaining. <laughs> hey, sci-fi fans. Do I have a real humdinger of a tale for you? This is regarding my time spent on the Gorman Ranch, a.k.a. Skinwalker Ranch in Utah Basin in Utah from 2003 to 2005. I worked with a team from an independent company who was working with the National Institute of Discovery Science, NIDS, the team that had already been there for a while. So much fun! I love science! And I went to the same science school as Dr. Jim and Professor Mike! <laughs> I would spend between a week and a month on the ranch and surrounding areas, then have two weeks to a month off, then return back with my team. I was there on and off from 2003 to 2005. <laughs> All right, I'll stop. Okay, I'll stop. Probably not the right tone. After getting into it, I do realize that probably didn't help with the sci-fi mood. Um, <laughs> that was fun for me. Most of what I just said uh, was from the first-hand account, though. Let, let me restart. I, I'll, I'll pick up where I left off but with a better, uh, more suitable, uh, you know, kind of mood. There we go. That's, uh, that's, yeah, that's way better. <clears throat> Allow me to continue. Now, any of you who know much about the ranch, know that by the early 2000s, most of the events had died down. There were no more missing animals, no crazy sounds, or weird monsters in the darkness. The NIDS team continued to monitor the ranch, but short of the occasional UFO sighting or strange ball of light off in the distance, there wasn't much to report. By the time I got there, August of 2003, it was like sitting on an old farm. We just hang out, play cards, and monitor equipment for any magnetic anomalies. I remember one time on my second visit, I saw some lights in the sky in the distance, and I got really excited, but it turned out to be just an airplane. Probably, <laughs> probably could have left that part out. So life went on like that for a while. I would go to the ranch or the surrounding areas, monitor the equipment, answer phones, feed the cattle and dogs. And a couple of times, I, I just missed an event by a day or so. I would get to the ranch and some of the team members would tell me that the night before I missed a flyby. After the fourth time going there, I began contemplating whether or not I wanted to keep doing this. I was just getting bored. The travel was getting to be a bit much. When I signed on, I had high hopes. I didn't think that my job would amount to me being a glorified ranch hand. And finally, on May 23rd, 2004, it happened. I had my first experience. It's been past dinner time, and we were sitting in the NIDS trailer. Outside, the dogs started going nuts. I had never heard them acting like that before. I figured Terry Sherman was probably punching them or something. Yeah, just dickhead. I looked out my window. I saw light being shined on the dog pen. I walked out with two of the other guys, and we saw a ball of light buzz by the dog pen and off through the field toward a line of trees. After a couple hundred yards, the ball curved in and flew off in a different direction, and then just winked out. Poof! Just like that, my mind was blown. I had finally seen something worth noting. This was the first experience I had. It only lasted about 45 seconds, but it made everything up to that point worth it. A few days later, the same visit, I saw one of the fabled black triangles that had been seen a lot during the heyday of the activity on the ranch. It was just after dusk. The sky wasn't completely dark and got a call from someone. I got a call from someone who lived near the ranch saying that they had just seen a UFO and it was headed in our direction. We were all looking at the sky and in a very short amount of time we saw a completely silent black triangle with one white light in the center. It didn't fly directly over us, but we did observe it flying over the property and then it flew off into the distance. It wasn't as cool as the ball of light we saw, but it did show that there was something to all this UFO stuff. After that sighting, I wouldn't see anything again until 2005. In the trailer, it was just me and one of the NIDS guys. We were just sitting around playing cards, as guys do. Suddenly, at the exact same moment, the air felt electrical and the dogs outside started going nuts again. Was Terry punching them this time? <laughs> I just dickhead. They sounded scared, yelping and whining. I got up from my seat to look out the window. I didn't see anything. 
and looked over at my partner, and he looked kind of dazed. I started to hear a sort of faint buzzing sound, and then it repeated itself. My partner kind of nodded and said, we need to go outside. So I followed him out of the trailer, and he looked up into the sky. I also looked up, and at first I didn't see anything. After scanning for a few seconds, I did notice a spot in the sky that was somehow darker than the rest of the sky. I couldn't make out an exact shape, but I could tell that something, something was there. He was looking straight up at what I thought was some sort of object. He told me he could hear it, but I didn't hear anything at all at that point. I'll never forget his face. It was almost a look of awe, kind of trance-like. After about a minute to two minutes, there was a quick bright flash of light in the sky. The electrical feeling in the air was gone, and the dark object was also gone. He turned to me and he told me that they had spoken to him. It's going to be hard for most of you to believe, and I wouldn't have believed it myself had I not been there. He told me that they knew what we were doing, and that they were doing the same thing, only our roles were reversed. He said that they told him that they have the advantage, and we cannot stop them from doing whatever they want to do. They also told him something like they were going to go back to work. I don't know, I guess, you know, they're on break or something. I wish I could remember the way he worded it. It, it was chilling the way he said it. Had I not been present for that, I highly doubt I would have believed a word of all of this, but the look on his face, the way he related to me, what had been said to him, made me a true believer. I'm not ashamed to admit I was terrified after that. When that week was over, I decided I was going to leave the ranch and never go back. I know this sounds ridiculous, especially the last part, but it scared the hell out of me, and there's no doubt in my mind that this guy was for real. I heard that someone else had claimed they heard him as well, but I really didn't know whether or not to believe them. As soon as I witnessed this guy, oh, I did believe. Listen up. There is some seriously scary stuff out there, and the world is a lot bigger than we tend to think it is. Okay. Unless this anonymous account was completely made up, and we have a lot of brazen liars putting together accounts like this, I mean, it is pretty intense. Obviously, if this happened like it was just laid out, ah, I mean, hard to say it's not indisputable evidence of extraterrestrial life. I think. If, big if, it happened. A lot of tales though, right? By the end of 2004, the National Institute for the Discovery of Science began shutting down. Bigelow was shifting his focus to a new project, Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies, BASS. He's not giving up, just changing focus. Archived versions of the Bigelow Aerospace Careers webpage say it focuses on the identification, evaluation, and acquisition of novel and emerging future technologies worldwide as they specifically relate to spacecraft. Noise. I don't know why I just said that. I had that guy's character voice stuck in my head from earlier. Uh, with the publishing of Hunt uh, for the Skywalker in 2005, interest in Skinwalker Ranch has sparked all over the world. And with this international fame comes a lot of trespassers who also start claiming to witness more incidents similar to the ones we've already covered. Before NIDS completely shut down ranch activities in 2007, the team had one more encounter with a portal on Skinwalker Ranch. But rather than seeing something drop out of it, something they can't tell exactly what it is, this time... They claim to witness a Sasquatch jump into the portal. Fuck yeah, bro. The ante has just been upped. About time a Squatch showed up in this suck. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hail Nimrod. According to the account of this ridiculous incident, researchers and ranch hands said that they literally chased a strange, hairy, bipedal creature. Our source doesn't say that Terry Sherman was one of the ranch hands, but it feels like this has Terry written all over it. Incredibly, just when the Sasquatch seemed to have been cornered by these assholes who apparently all forgot to bring their cell phones. Cell phones did almost always come with cameras in 2007, but whatever. Uh, The cornered Squatch ran up a steep hill, then jumped into a large orange tunnel that appeared out of thin air, disappearing forever. Classic Squatch! No one catches the hide-and-seek world champion. Oh, you think you have him cornered? Huh? Wake up and smell the fucking wormhole! He's a 12th level warlock who can summon interdimensional wormholes at will. You just got squatched. Obviously, this story is a little harder to believe than most of the other encounters, but how can I not include it? It's too entertaining. I'm going to throw this account in the same file I toss everything Terry Sherman says into. Uh, Did I mention that Terry and his family are still hanging around the ranch? Yeah. In one area that had previously been a hotbed of strange activity, six sophisticated surveillance cameras are installed. Six cameras film in the area 24-7 now. But after several months of filming, nothing of any significance is captured on tape. Where did all the skinwalkers go? Where did the aliens and the squatches go? Terry Sherman has that answer. Obviously, these creatures have the ability to turn invisible at will. That is what he claims. Terry figured this out when he and his son watched the 1987 Arnold Schwarzenegger action film Predator. 
If you haven't seen it, your life has been a complete and utter waste of time. Also, if you haven't seen it, it's about a technologically advanced alien who shows up on Earth to stalk and hunt people. And it can basically become invisible and blended to its surroundings. What it can't do is kill Arnold fucking Schwarzenegger. Maybe I should take a trip to the ranch. Maybe I'm the only man who can defeat a skinwalker. Ah, face me, skinwalker. I'll break you like you wish you could break a tiny cow, baby. But seriously, Jerry and his son watch this fucking movie and have this aha. So that's how these creatures hide from the cameras. And they seriously, that's what they believe now. I love it. Still in 2007, an unnamed agent from the Defense Intelligence Agency contacts Robert Budget Bucks Bigelow and requests to see the ranch in person. Bigelow obliges, and the agent ends up seeing something he cannot explain. He reports his experience to his superiors. This goes further, leads eventually to Nevada Senator Harry Re- uh, Harry Reid, who earmarks over $20 million of the Defense Department's budget to fund the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, which includes studying reports on what's going on at Skinwalker Ranch. Pretty interesting that this happened. Bob Bigelow and Senator Reid talked extensively about paranormal events being witnessed on Skinwalker Ranch, and now the government is spending millions to find out what the fuck is going on. This leads me to believe that a lot of the sightings uh, probably were a lot more credible than Terry Sherman's crazy stories. Uh, J- January 29th, 2008, Bass, again, Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies, that second venture of Bigelow's, officially files as a new company. In June of 2008, MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, enters the Skinwalker Ranch picture. Originally called the Midwest UFO Network, MUFON was founded in 1969 by Walt Andrus, resident of Illinois, and Dr. Alan R. Utke, Associate Professor of Chemistry at one time at Wisconsin State University. Both were also once members of the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, APRO. They started MUFON as an observer network to record and investigate UFO sightings and other aerial anomalies around the world. And MUFON's international director at the time, James Carrion, and a member of uh, MUFON board members, excuse me, and a number of MUFON board members uh, meet with Bobby Budget Bucks and negotiate a contract with Bigelow Aerospace. Uh, MUFON's executive director, Gene Harzan, recalled Bigelow saying, if we were uh, able to offer, if we were able to fund you so you could put investigators on the ground faster, could you get better data on some of these reports? Together, MUFON and Bigelow uh, support investigators' fact-finding expeditions and share data, uh, though they do so for less than a year. The original document dated February 2009 provided MUFON with much-needed funds to continue operations as well as finance the establishment of what was to be called a rapid response team, a team that would consist of a group of investigators who within 24 hours of receiving information regarding high-value UFO sightings could converge at the UFO sighting location. In return, Bigelow Aerospace would receive, in addition to other services, direct access to MUFON's case management system, their real-time database of UFO sightings. MUFON agrees to provide both weekly and monthly reports to Bigelow Aerospace, and Bigelow Aerospace gets the rights to any evidence of extraterrestrial life, recovered materials, or testimony that MUFON obtains. In the contract, Bigelow Aerospace agrees to pay $672,000 in 12 monthly installments of $56,000, but subsequent correspondence uh, between the two parties suggests the actual total cost ended up being closer to $400,000. Because of the drop in money, the partnership quickly sours. Uh, according to MUFON's international director, James Carrion, Mr. Bigelow invalidated his own legal contract by refusing to abide by the original deal, struck with MUFON, and instead changed the terms midstream. Carrion also said he uncovered some damaging information about Skinwalker Ranch. He didn't say what it was. And uh, all of this led to his resignation from MUFON. Hmm. Did MUFON find out that Terry Sherman was full of shit? Did he find out that others may have been lying about or at least exaggerating what was going on or not going on at the ranch? Don't know. 2009, a Pentagon briefing summary given by the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program Director reportedly claims, the United States is incapable of defending itself against some of the technologies discovered. So this is interesting, right? I love this uh, timeline where it just goes up and down for me where I'm like, that's fucking crazy. No way. And then all of a sudden the next thing is like, oh, okay. All right. That's very interesting. Uh, Senator Reid then reportedly tries unsuccessfully to heighten the program's security due to extraordinary discoveries. And as much progress has been made with the identification of several highly sensitive, unconventional aerospace-related findings. So a lot of interesting language about this with the government that hints towards, you know, uh, possible UFO discoveries. Uh, but what about skinwalkers? Where the fuck are the skinwalkers? Well, they show up again in ranch lore in 2010. 2010, a memo by Bass Task Force highlights investigations into no less than 10 separate accounts of witnesses claiming to have seen dog-like monsters. 
One witness claims to have allegedly shot one of these beasts with a pellet gun and then watched the pellets bounce right off. Okay, this asshole seems only slightly less dumb than Terry Sherman. Why would you shoot a monster with a pellet gun? How do you see that working out? He said that the creature was covered along its entire body with long, thick red fur or hair, approximately three inches in length, though less so around the shoulders and neck. The creature's neck was described as, a, as dog-like and thicker than that of a human, had a dog's snout, red eyes that were round and slanted towards the outer edges. The body of the creature was bigger than a deer, tall and thin in stature, and over six feet tall. The arms were bent at the elbows like a kangaroo's. It smelled like sulfur and made a sound described as grunting or growling. Some kind of, some kind of demon skinwalker squatch thing. Again, who sees this and thinks, quick, grab my pellet gun. A pellet gun will surely slay this beast. Uh, February 12, 2012, the power goes out in Fort Duchesne. And shortly after this outage, multiple witnesses report seeing a strange green glow in the sky. And some witnesses also claim to see a massive UFO. To the, also in 2012, uh, Bass loses funding from the Department of Defense. Budget Bob continues to fund extra, extraterrestrial exploration, though, with his own money. In 2016, Skinwalker Ranch is sold for the rumored amount of $4.5 million to an undisclosed buyer operating under the corporation Adamantium Holdings, LLC. Way to go, Budget Bob! That's a deal. Buys the property in 1996 for $200,000. Sells it for uh, $4.5 mil 20 years later. Classic Budget Bob! That's why he's a billionaire and the rest of us are just hanging around watching him win. Adamantium, by the way, is a reference to a fictional metal alloy appearing in some of the Marvel comic books. Uh, best known as a substance bonded to Wolverine's skeleton and his claws. And I would like it for Christmas. Pretty please. Okay? All I want this year is an ad 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 adamantium skeleton. Is that really too much to ask? Also in 2016, Hickens Road, a public road, which had run through Skinwalker Ranch, is legally vacated. All access to the road leading to the ranch now becomes closed to the public. A checkpoint is erected as well as a large sign warning the public not to approach the gate. Interesting. Guess I won't head to Utah this fall and chase squatches and punch skinwalkers. Why are they shutting things down? Early this year, on March 10th, 2020, a Vice article is published that reveals the previously unknown identity of the owner of the Adamantium Ranch, Brandon Fugel. He was asked, why the hell did you buy it? And he said, you're right, it's strange. Skinwalker Ranch as a project is so unconventional and so outside of my normal course of business, and really, frankly, anyone's normal course of business, that it presents a whole new problem set. I've lost some sleep over it. I worry about what some of my clients and colleagues will think. It's controversial. That's why I've waited so long and stayed out of the spotlight. Who is Brandon Fugel? Well, he's a guy who's made a lot of money in a variety of entrepreneurial enterprises. He's the co-founder and owner of Caldwell Banker Commercial Advisors, a huge real estate company. Uh, he's purchased a lot of real estate himself. His bio is written for the History Channel show where he makes appearances. The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch says, as the chairman of Colliers International in Utah, Brandon is one of the most prominent businessmen and real estate developers in the Intermountain West. He's got a lot of money. By his own admission, Brandon's a bit of a sci-fi nerd. He has a large movie memorabilia collection, complete with the shot-up jacket Arnold Schwarzenegger wore in The Terminator and the black robe Marlon Brando wore in The Superman, the movie, when he uh, sentenced General Zod to an eternity in Krypton's interdimensional prison system. Uh, like Bigelow, he's always dreamed of the possibilities of the paranormal and extraterrestrial, uh, you know, uh, the possibilities they represented for technology. In 2010, he and several other investors launched a project focused on testing gravitational physics theories involving exotic propulsion and renewable energy. In really simple terms, it was an attempt to create a gravitational reduction device that could produce clean energy. Didn't work, but uh, that failure didn't let, uh, you know, didn't stop Fugel from, from making more purchases like Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, he continues to invest in and launch other technology companies from various software ventures to most recently a company that has developed a shoebox size, high performance liquid uh, chromatograph that enables immediate analysis of various liquids such as blood. And Fugel's interest in extraterrestrials, you know, led him to being introduced to budget Bob Bigelow. Fugel would later say it was an absolute honor to meet Mr. Bigelow. He is a very intriguing fellow. I consider him a friend. And Bigelow Aerospace reminded me of a James Bond villain lair. Very cool. Uh, the two got to discussing Skinwalker Ranch. Fugel was intrigued. He flew in on his private helicopter, assessed the property, and purchased Skinwalker Ranch following months of legal negotiations. When he was asked by Vice if he himself had experienced any definite UFO sighting at the ranch, he curiously dodged the question. He said, A shockingly high number of people who I consider normal have had UFO sightings on the property, and they have not broadcast it. I have had some very credible and highly respected people tell me their stories. Many of those individuals 
have been with others who all simultaneously saw an aerial anomaly. That is all I can say about that. So interesting. That carries a lot more weight uh, with me than Terry uh, Sherman's bullshit. I was almost off for a bit, but now I think I'm back on team. Some alien type stuff has probably actually happened at Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, Fugel is committed to studying the ranch from a scientific perspective. As for my team, he said device, my scientists will be working on releasing reports and information on a peer reviewed basis in the future. You know, in order for something to be properly understood from a scientific perspective, it has to be characterized physically. You have to have repeatable results. It can't be anecdotal. It can't be random. There have to be physical laws that govern it. And right now, what we're doing is trying to gain a better understanding or a new understanding relative to the physical laws that are being challenged right now. So go get them, Brandon. Give the world the proof we all want. Find that damn wormhole, Squatch. Catch that skinwalker. Don't let Terry tee off on it with a bat this time. On March 31st, 2020, Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch premieres on the History Channel. Fugel participates in the show, as he as does his assembled team, as they continue to search for the unknown at Skinwalker Ranch to this day. And that brings us to the end of this week's highly unusual and extremely interesting Time Suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. What a crazy tale, huh? I mean, so what really is going on out at Skinwalker Ranch? Uh, Before I try and answer that, we need to take one last sponsor break. Uh, Today's Time Suck is brought to you by Woody's Spirit Supplies and More Spectral Emporium. Hi, Jensen Germs. This is Woody, your favorite paranormal puppet. And I'm bringing back my original product, Woody's Paranormal Rape Repellent. Have we talked about demon rape yet? No, we haven't. And that's why you need to buy it if you're anywhere near Skinwalker Ranch. It's about the only thing left that hasn't happen there yet. So someone's vagina and her butt's bound to get buggered. But buy a Skinwalker or an alien or a Sasquatch or a demon. Maybe even buy that funny time-traveling fella in the bedazzled blue jacket. Or maybe buy a monster water snake. They could be demonic. Likely even. And bound to be rapey. So please buy my spray. It's, it's been damn near two years since I first tried to sell it. <laughs> Charles Goodman's gone. I, I haven't seen him all summer. I'm alone. I'm hungry. I'm sleeping in the dumpster. I'm, t- I'm tired of just sipping the last little slurps of Mad Dog and more liquor from bottles I find in alleys. If you don't buy my spray, I'll put a curse on you. I'll curse you. I'll be forever stuck in whatever evil squat plate dimension last night at Skinwalker Ranch. The spray is just nine ninety nine a bottle. And this month is it's buy one get one free. <laughs> Wee! Uh, wow. Uh, whew. Of course, Woody would show up after being missing for months, and this uh, suck. Ah, poor Woody. He just right when I think he's hit rock bottom. You know, he just seems like he slips down a little further. Uh, I'm surprised Terry Sherman never claimed to have seen Woody at the ranch or be accosted by him at some point. Uh, old friend of the show, if you're confused, new listener. Okay, I'm back now. Here's a brief run-through of the most popular theories about what the fuck is going on at Skinwalker Ranch. Theory one that is that the whole thing is a massive, decades-long, legal-as-fuck, military PSYOP ops, uh, you know, program or operation. Uh, PSYOP is short for Psychological Operations, which are operations designed to influence a targeted audience's emotions, motives, objective reasoning. The purpose of United States PSYOPs is to induce or reinforce behavior favorable to U.S. objectives. A well-known PSYOP occurred during World War II uh, when engineers at the first radio section of the first MRBC recorded POW interviews uh, for frontline broadcasts and reproduced the sound effects of vast numbers of tanks and other motor vehicles for Allied armored units in attempts to mislead German intelligence and lower German morale. Uh, Sometimes it's hard to tell if something's a PSYOP or not. Many think that the toppling of Saddam Hussein's statue in Baghdad was a PSYOP as in it was designed to become an iconic image and wasn't the spontaneous event it appeared to be. So is Skinwalker Ranch like the biggest PSYOP? Terry Sherman himself has long suspected that his former property was a secret military testing ground. Of course he, of course he has. Uh, he feels that users of advanced military technology ranging from stealth aircraft to portable cloaking devices were running around willy-nilly on the ranch. Terry thought the user's behavior seemed to indicate that the residents and the reactions to the phenomena were being monitored too. I don't feel, I feel like there's, there's a, there isn't a conspiracy that, that Terry Sherman probably doesn't believe in. Uh, the Shermans were just as much as part of the experiment as the tech, according to Terry. But could this be true? Could the military really be testing exotic, cutting-edge technologies on ranchers out in Utah? I mean, I don't know. I guess it's possible. It's not that much crazier than, say, Project MK MKUltra. Uh, continuing with the secret military stuff uh, line of thought, some people believe that Skinwalker Ranch and the surrounding area lies on top of a deep, 
underground military base or dumb where the military produces the strange technology that the Shermans and Bigelow's uh, and other scientists or excuse me, and Bigelow scientists saw on the ranch. According to some, this would explain some of the underground rumblings and odd industrial noises heard in northern Utah. I don't know. I mean, the U.S. military certainly has the funding to dig random tunnels and hollow out mountains to build secret bases, but would they really use said bases to fuck with the minds of their constituents? Uh, and to what end? Uh, the second theory is the oldest theory, that the land is literally cursed. Cursed by possibly ancient natives, uh, maybe more recent indigenous people, or I don't know, dinosaur ghosts. Who knows? Why not? As we've seen, anything is possible. That's going to walk a ranch. Uh, seriously, though, some people do believe that someone uh, lost to history did curse this land long, long ago. Uh, another theory, one of the weirdest, is that the area possesses some form of super consciousness, meaning basically the land itself is alive and collects werewolves and squatches and hobbits and shit. Uh, the Shermans, of course, are, <laughs> are open to this possibility. It's so hard not to shit on them just constantly. Uh, <laughs> they claimed that they'd often felt the presence uh, of this super intelligence, that it was actively eavesdropping on them. And uh, this belief was apparently confirmed when the intelligence reacted to an offhand remark Gwen once made. She briefly mentioned to Terry uh, her fear of something bad happening to her new prized bulls. Immediately afterwards, Terry goes outside, is shocked to find that those very bulls are nowhere to be found. And then they do find their missing bulls, and then the condition they find them in defies explanation. The animals are discovered lined up, neatly placed into a locked trailer. Not only that, they're staring off into space as if they somehow got switched off and were in, in a complete trance. The very second that Terry Sherman opens the trailer, the bulls come to life as if someone had just unpaused them. As crazy as all this is, the possibility of a sentient precognitive intelligence existing and making its presence known in and around Skinwalker Ranch eventually became one of the prevailing theories among Bobberts and IDS researchers. Their findings pointed to the conclusion that an unknown intelligence, which could predict events, was attempting to interact with people in a variety of ways. Another popular theory is that the ranch is a portal to another dimension. Because of a tunnel between dimensions or a rip or some other aberration, some kind of a multiverse shit, uh, that things from that dimension keep showing up in this dimension. Like, like Squatch. A, and also a super weak but also very hard to kill Skinwalker Wolf thing. So is this random place in Utah the gateway to another dimension? Uh, as we've mentioned, according to eyewitness testimony from both the Shermans and the NIDS researchers, random portals have appeared above the landscape on several occasions and UFOs and strange creatures supposedly came busting out of them or went into them, or both. This idea, I should note, did not actually originate with the Shermans. Local tribal lore has long described the appearance of doorways to other worlds, particularly a dark or underworld that's a mirror image to ours. Another theory is that there are real genuine aliens on or passing through Skinwalker Ranch all the time, and a long list of possible explanations, at least 100 of them, have something to do with extraterrestrial life. One is that aliens are running psychological testing on their favorite, you know, earth apes. Their, their favorite meat sacks, us. Uh, one last theory before we recap, one we already talked about, uh, that all these people have essentially just made this shit up or, uh, or out of their minds. Maybe they just live in an area that actively encourages group mind rather than individual mind, and these people have managed to give themselves false memories from other suggestions. I mean, the human brain is a crazy thing, does some weird stuff. I have a harder time believing this one than I used to, partially because, you know, recent revelations and declassifications from the federal government have shed new light on UFOs, have shown just how serious the government is taking the possibility of extraterrestrial life, making contact with Earth. I don't know. Perhaps if we wait long enough, the tinfoil hatters who have been warning us about the multidimensional shape-shifting reptiles, the Anunnaki, that Skinwalk as our leaders, will prove themselves to be right all along. Oh, won't that be fun? If David David Icke is finally like, I, I told you! I've been, I've been saying this since the 90s. I told you. The reptilians are real. Who knows? A lot of possibilities, right? Let's recap. Lots of pieces to the strange, strange story. We didn't cover all of them. There's, there's been hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of sightings and encounters. We did cover a lot of them. Uh, we talked a lot about skinwalkers, Sasquatch, a uh, fat alien said in some kind of flying saucer, you know, office situation. We talked about a weird, non-confrontational, bulletproof wolf skinwalker thing. A uh, strange traveler who wore a weird, blue, sparkly outfit under his normal outfit. We mentioned dinosaur bones, giant monster snakes, butterized dogs. Uh, Skinwalker Ranch really is some kind of land of the fucking lost. Uh, we mentioned strange blue balls of light that seem to scan the Shermans, some predator-like camouflaged aliens. We didn't really touch on poltergeists and demonic shit, uh, but people have also reported those claims over the years. Let me at least reference it now. In some stories, there's the ghost of a little girl on Skinwalker Ranch whose voice can be heard faintly in multiple languages. Some people believe in an entity called the Dark One, said to be a shaman who serves as a gatekeeper to the portals found in the area. 
Uh, these tales seem more fitting for uh, my scared to death podcast. Uh, as much as I joke around, I find all of this super fascinating. So much being reported in such a small geographical area. I can't think of anything comparable. Like the Bermuda Triangle comes to mind, but that is a much bigger area with a lot less reports or, you know, many less reports of super weird, very specific, crazy shit happening all the time. Uh, is something going on in a little patch of high desert, you know, in, in northern, eastern Utah, you know, settled by homesteaders John and Emma Myers over a century ago? Like I said earlier in the episode, like I say all the time on Scared to Death, if just one, if just one of these accounts is true, then our world suddenly has gotten a lot bigger and a lot weirder. I'm going to choose to believe that at least some of these accounts are true, partially because of the sheer volume of reported encounters and mostly because I just want to. What do you believe? I guess you'll have to, you have to make up your own mind. There's going to be a lot of opinions on this one. Uh, time now for top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, legends of crazy shit happening in the Skinwalker Ranch area are thousands of years old. With the first native legend of the Skinwalker possibly recorded in a rock engraving, the Buckhorn Draw pictograph panel in the San Rafael Swell just 184 miles from Skinwalker Ranch. Number two, hundreds if not thousands of people have reported seeing UFOs in the Uintah Basin area over the last eight decades. Is it all crowd psychology, false memories, people desperate to one-up each other? Or is something or some things, are they really out there? Number three, skinwalkers are terrifying. Essentially evil witches. They can drive you insane, kill, eat you, eat your livestock, generally ruin your life. If you see one, do not pull a Terry Sherman and start swinging a bat. Number four, skinwalker ranch is a regular cornucopia of cryptid and otherwise paranormal critters, big feet, skinwalkers, aliens, monster snakes, demons, all possibly dicking around in some kind of desert dinosaur graveyard. Number five, new info. There are actually a few Bob Lazar connections to Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, Bob Lazar was the first person to provide information on Area 51 to the public and claimed to have worked on reverse engineering an alien craft in a secret facility, amongst other claims. His interview with Joe Rogan and Netflix specials have repopularized his story in recent years and made me rethink his level of credibility. I am starting to wonder if maybe Bob isn't quite as full of shit as I once thought. Uh, it's because of Bob that we really uh, you know, know about Area 51 in terms of you know, alien lore. And Area 51 is, a, is part of what some internet experts have called the Bermuda Triangle of UFOs. The other two points being Roswell, New Mexico, and dun dun dun, Skinwalker Ranch. And here's another link between Lazar and Skinwalker Ranch. George Knapp, the guy that wrote the book on the ranch, is the same investigative reporter who interviewed Lazar in 1989 when the story first broke. And he's a co-producer on the, on the Lazar documentaries, Bob Lazar, Area 51, and Flying Saucers. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Skinwalker Ranch has been sucked. That was a lot of fun. So much weird shit. What if the Shermans really did experience everything they've claimed? I guess if that's, you know, true, I'll, I'll owe Terry a bigger apology than I owe uh, Roy Disney. An apology almost as big as the one I owe Pat Sajak. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help and making time suck. Uh, Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley. Script Keeper, Zach Flannery. Bit Elixir. Uh, Logan and Kate Keith running badmagicmerch.com and the socials. Thanks to all of those who have joined the Cult of the Curious private Facebook group. Over 21,000 members who continue to make time suck more than a podcast. Hail Nimrod. Thank you to Sophie Fax Sorceress Evans, who is now a full-time paid staff researcher, no longer an intern. She's kicking ass and improving the show. Uh, yay. Thanks also to Liz Hernandez and her all-seeing eyes running the Cult of the Curious Facebook page and to the wonderful weirdos having fun on Discord. Thank you, Meat Sack. I mean, not Meat Sack. Beefsteak. It's close. And finally, thanks to all the space scissors playing Time Suck Trivia on the app. Sergeant Awesome, currently in the lead with 3,276 points. Uh, a current round ends on September 7th, and then, you know, somebody else gets a cowboy pigeon trophy. Uh, next week on Time Suck, we return to the world of true crime in one of the most unique crime cases in U.S. history, 1974, Patty Hearst, the 19-year-old granddaughter of wealthy newspaper publisher William Randolph Hearst, is kidnapped from her apartment in Berkeley, California by three armed strangers. Her fiancé, Stephen Weed, is beaten, tied up along with a neighbor who tried to help. Witnesses reported seeing a struggle between uh, Hearst and her captors as she's carried away blindfolded, then she's put in the trunk of a car in a hail of bullets. Three days later, the Symbionese Liberation Army, SLA, a small U.S. leftist group, announces in a letter to a Berkeley radio station that it's holding Hearst as a prisoner of war. Four days later, the SLA demands that the Hearst family give money for food to every needy person from Santa Rosa to Los Angeles. 
Randolph Hearst reluctantly gives away $2 million, but the SLA says not enough and demands $6 million more. Then shit gets even crazier. In one of the most famous cases of Stockholm Syndrome, Patty would soon uh, join her captors in committing crimes and participate in an armed robbery of a San Francisco bank and then another robbery in Los Angeles. Then in a tape sent to authorities, she declares that she has joined the SLA of her own free will. What the fuck? Her kidnapping will culminate in California's largest raid, a major crime spree that will leave at least one person dead and a trial that will captivate America. Do not miss next week's suck on the kidnapping of Patty Hearst. Now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker Updates. Going to start off today with some cool additional Disney info. Coming in from, coming in from Super Sucker, Dakota McCarley. Uh, Dakota writes, hey, Suckmaster, I just wanted to say I'm disappointed you didn't mention why Mickey Mouse and other beloved characters wear gloves. It's because when the original shorts were made, they were in black and white, meaning that you wouldn't be able to see the contrast between Mickey's fingers. Not a huge thing, but it's something I had never thought about before. Just a short update, so I won't apologize for the long email. I love that that's been a running thing now. Uh, Keep on sucking, Dakota McCarley. Well, keep on sucking, Dakota. Awesome info, and that does make a lot of sense. I would have never guessed that, though. I actually never questioned the fact that Mickey's wearing gloves, which in hindsight seems seems odd. I mean, it is kind of weird. He doesn't have a fucking shirt, but he has gloves on. Who wears, who wears gloves and no shirt? Uh, thank you again for that inf- information. Uh, next update. This is intense. Holy shit. Uh, comes in from Magnificent Meat Sack, Barry Gummo. And Barry writes, Dear Suckmaster Nasty, I usually sit back and enjoy the episodes in the background while I'm on my daily grind at my business. With the Columbine suck, however, that had to change. The year after the shooting, a friend and I stopped a plan that would have killed me and him along with who knows how many more. Sitting in our eighth grade pre-algebra class with us was a loner of a kid, smart as a whip, but not very well liked and didn't seem to want to be either. He was a bit overweight, thick glasses, always made sure to let you know that he was smarter than you. We had some fun at his expense and he took shots right back at us. We were 13. It was just how life was. One day while passing in homework, I noticed a gun barrel in his backpack. This had made it past all of the new cameras, cops on campus, and the teachers. When I spotted it, I motioned for my friend Tommy, who was behind this kid, to take a look. We immediately questioned him about it, hoping he was just carrying a piece to a gun, not the real thing. Turns out, it was his paintball gun. He wanted to scare us with it. He had brought it as a test run for the following week. He figured if he could get it through, he wouldn't have a problem with whatever weapons and such he was planning to bring later. He was right until I saw the glint of light hit the barrel. We had no idea. When we first, when we turned him in, the following raid led to a list he dubbed first to go that had 50 names. My friend Tommy was number one. I was number three. Cue months of counseling and testifying to authorities. Had Columbine not happened in the same calendar year, I may not have ever thought twice about it. Kids used to bring paintball guns and knives to school all the time in my rural Pennsylvania town. Crazy how life can go from innocent to ruthlessly real in a heartbeat. Teach your children to be kind, which was my mistake, vigilant, and sadly to trust little until proven trustworthy. Sorry for the long email, question mark. Thanks for all you do. Uh, Stay safe and healthy. I think your podcast is solid. Would not change a thing. Three out of five stars, Barry. Well, thank you, Barry. Uh, I love love that the three out of five stars has fucking gotten out of control. (laughs) I see it all over in reviews. It kills me. Uh, yes, Barry, man. Thank you for the reminder. That is important. Don't let fear rule your life, rule your life, but also stay vigilant. Uh, you know, there are, as we've learned here so many times on uh, time suck over and over again, a lot of dangerous people in the world. You know, you see something like that, say something, see something, say something, your life could depend on it or the lives, uh, the lives of others. Thank you, Barry and hail Nimrod. Uh, our next message writer, sweet sack, Corbin Gallagher just got caught in a real shit storm. Corbin writes, Hello, Master Sucker, Prophet, and Nimrod. I feel compelled to write you just to say thank you for everything you and the Bad Magic crew do. I live in eastern Iowa, which was hit by a derecho. show. Sorry, I, my allergies. I've, I ran out of allergy medicine, and it's making a little hard. My mush mouth is mushier than normal, if you didn't notice this week. Uh, my eastern Iowa. I live in eastern Iowa, which was hit by a derecho. There we go. I think it's a derecho. There we go. Storm on Monday. I am writing this on Thursday, where even though I... Uh, uh, where even though I, as well as 200, uh, 200 other, God dang it, I am so sorry for butchering your message. I'm writing this on Thursday, where even though I, as well as 200,000 other people are still without power. Uh, cell coverage has improved enough to allow some access. 
after a full day of internally wondering how to process all of the damage while beginning to remove debris and run a chainsaw in the hot, humid Iowa sun, I was able to get enough of a signal to listen to the Walt Disney suck. My brother and I sat in the dark, drinking beer and laughing. And that is what we needed more than anything. I know this is sappy, but I just wanted to let you know that your podcast has been a lifesaver for me while I'm wondering when I can get this tree off my house or when uh, power will return so I can start working again. Thanks for all you do. Your loyal spaces are Corbin Gallagher. Hail Nimrod. Well, holy shit, Corbin. And again, sorry about not being able to read for about a minute there. Uh, and sorry about your damn house. God, man. Uh, glad that some of my silly horse shit could throw some light in a dark day. I hope it's still not literally dark. Uh, where you're at and that power is restored. You must really hate 2020. Glad you're not physically injured. Uh, hope this suck brought you and your bro some more laughs. All right, two more. Sad message and a funny message. Uh, some sadness first. At least it gets uh, sad at the end of the message. Uh, my heart goes out to longtime sucker Cam and his friend Chris. Cam writes, Air Illbilly, or Air Hillbilly, Presidente, Mushmouth, Suckmaster. My name is Cameron. I've been a fan of yours for well over a decade. Your stand-up, Crazy with a Capital F, is by far one of my favorite stand-ups. Oh, thanks, man. I apologize that this email may be a tad long as it has a story and a shout-out. My coworker, Mike, whom I made fun of for listening to podcasts, introduced me to the wonderful world of Time Suck, Episode 5. The Great Clown Scare of 2016 hooked me in because it literally made me laugh until I cried because I relate to it so well. Fuck poltergeists and fuck clowns. <laughs> Not to mention I was born and raised and still live in North Spokane and work in Hayden next to the Coeur d'Alene Airport. Oh, cool. Between your stand-up and time suck, it makes a daily commute that much less miserable. Thank you for that. To kick it way back, I wanted to tell you a quick story in regards to shadow people. Yeah. Let me start by saying I am not at all a person who believes in spirits or ghosts, but that particular episode gave me straight-up goosebumps because when I was younger, I had an experience I never shared with anyone. I literally relived this moment in my mind when listening to the episode. I had to have been about eight or 10 years old. I slept alone in the basement all the time. Man, ugh, right away, I'm like, why? I still to this day personally feel it was a sleep paralysis, a sleep paralysis based nightmare, but it has always stuck with me. I was just nodding off when the nightmare began. I recall seeing my bedroom floor covered in hundreds of red eyes all funneling into my closet. Jesus. As I lay there quietly watching the scene unfold in the closet being slightly, slightly agape, I could see all those eyes converge into one black mass out of fear, I closed my eyes for a second. Then upon opening my eyes, I could only see a massive black figure that filled my closet to the top. A second later, two large red eyes pop open towards the top of the human-esque mask. The human-esque mass, I stare quietly at it as it quietly stares at me. A second later, my closet began to slowly open and the monstrous red-eyed figure began to emerge slowly towards me. At this point in time, I began to scream bloody murder. My father ran down to make sure I was okay, at which point my open closet was naturally empty. My dad uh, may have chewed my ass, but I have never been happier for an ass chewing, mainly because he was there with me. I have never felt fear like that to this day. Still gives me chills as I write this. Yeah, yeah, that's a fucking terrible nightmare at the very least. All this being said, I truly was hoping by some miracle you will get this and could help me out with a shout out for a dear friend of mine. My longtime friend, Chris, who's been battling cancer for years now, has recently received news that this is one battle he will not win. I am fighting back tears as I write this, and I'm at a loss for words, but I do have this to say. Chris, I love you like a brother, and I am grateful I had the privilege of having you as my friend, whom I share so many amazing experiences with. From the butt-clinching rides in Mexico to the safety-first surprise I left for you guys in the car, these are memories I shall cherish and share for the rest of my days. I can't imagine what you're going through now, but just know this. I am here with you to the end. I might be an asshole, but I'm a good asshole, and that means I will always be right behind you. Talking shit, LOL. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. You will always have a special place in my heart and throughout this life and beyond. You will always be one of the best friends this world has to offer. Thank you for always being there when I was at my lowest and thank you for all the laughs and good times. I'll always pee into the wind just to think of you. You're a friend always and forever, Cam. Thank you for everything, Dan. Respectfully, Spaces are Cam. Wow, man. Uh, sorry, so sorry, Chris. I hope wherever you're heading, some world beyond this, uh, it, that world is free from pain and, and beautiful. Can't imagine. Can't imagine what you're going through. And Cam, you're, you're a damn good friend. Thanks for the reminder for us all not to take our friends and family for granted. Tell the people you care about that you care about them. None of us know how much time we have. Um, thank you for the message. Hail Nimrod to you both. Do, do not know what else to say there. Uh, Going to end on a, on a lighter note. Funny meat sack Liz Dellett. Sounds like she has a dad like uh, me. Liz writes, Hello, suck crew. I just listened to the Disney suck. And I was reminded of one of my favorite memories when Dan talked about messing with his son, Kyler. 
I was fortunate as a kid to have gone to Disneyland a few times. My father's favorite joke to make was in the line at the Tiki Tiki room. He would tell me that the birds were real and we're going to fly down in the middle of the show and peck out our eyes. <laughs> I was about 10 or 11. My father said that because uh, him and my mom wore glasses, they were safe from the birds. He played a lot of jokes on me, so I knew he was bullshitting. But the kid in line behind us did not. <laughs> we go in, sit down, and the show starts. The bird starts singing and the kid starts crying. His dad is trying to calm him down throughout the whole show. Afterwards, we all stand up to leave and a guy starts pushing through other people, beelining for my dad. This was a big guy. <laughs> my dad rushed us out of the attraction and ran away from the angry dad. We never saw that dad again, but I think of this anytime I think of Disneyland. I thought you would all get a good chuckle out of this. Thanks for all you do. Keep on sucking, Liz. Oh, Liz, I love that. Love that message. I love your dad. Uh, tell, tell your dad. I love him. Uh, Hail Lucifina. He's, he's got some rascal in him. It's good. Makes life more fun. I'm giving my kids lots of stories like that. Hope you and your dad can hit Disneyland again when the world settles down a bit. Thanks to all of you for your messages. Stay safe out there. Thanks for this uh, community and keep on sucking. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Just like that, another suck is done. Appreciate the uh, recent ratings and reviews for Time Suck. Uh, been pretty high in the comedy charts recently, and uh, it's, exci it's exciting. I appreciate it. Check out my uh, new podcast with Reverend Dr. Joe, uh, Is We Dumb? Two episodes already out. The next one drops Wednesday the 19th, noon Pacific time. If you head to Skinwalker Ranch this week, please, for fuck's sake, have your camera ready and keep on sucking. <laughs> I remember my experience at Skinwalker Ranch. It was July 27th, 1986. I was 15 years old. I had a pellet gun, a baseball bat, and an axe to grind with the world. I walked out of the ranch. I saw in the distance a Sasquatch riding a, riding a unicorn. He's just been beamed down by an alien, I'm pretty sure. And they were fighting, the two of them, with a giant water snake and I thought this is this is how I prove my manhood and I got my bat and I approached them and as I got closer fucking leprechaun sucker punched me and I was like ah god damn it leprechaun get away from me I'm trying to fight the unicorn and the sasquatch so now I'm wrestling with this leprechaun and that's when a chubacabra kicked me right in the dick ah skinwalker ranch why must you work so hard to defeat me and that's when I gave up, and I'm ashamed to admit it, I gave up and I, I levitated. I would recently learned to levitate, and uh, I went back and, and that, was, that was what drew me to the ranch. And years later, I, Terry Sherman, would of course purchase some land, and try and get my revenge. And, ha! I don't know, it's the mind, it's a funny thing, right? Creatures and whatnots. Anyway, I gotta go. I gotta go. I, uh, I've been raising some uh, some gremlins, I'm selling them for money online. The real gremlins, if you want, just go to Terry Sherman. Dot. What the fuck am I even talking about ever? And I'll happily sell you a gremlin or a unicorn puppy for, uh, for five bucks. I don't, I, what do I care? 